The Hundred Years' War on Palestine, A History of Settler Colonial Conquest and Resistance, 1917-2017 Book by Rashid Khalidi Audiobook presented by the Learner's Library Contents Chapter 3 The Third Declaration of War, 1967 Chapter 4 The Fourth Declaration of War, 1982 Chapter 3 The Third Declaration of War, 1967 I was trying to see how an event is made and unmade, as ultimately it only exists via what one says about it, since it is properly speaking fabricated by those who spread its renown. George Duby On a bright, sunny morning early in June 1967, I walked out of Grand Central Station in Manhattan, en route from our family home in Mount Vernon to my father's office in the United Nations building. The Six-Day War was raging in the Middle East, and the news reports indicated that the Egyptian, Syrian, and Jordanian air forces had been wiped out in a first strike by Israel. I dreaded the prospect of another crushing Israeli victory, but even with my limited exposure to military strategy, I knew that an army in the desert without air cover would be easy pickings for any air force, especially one as powerful as Israel's. Out on 42nd Street, I noticed a commotion. Several people on the sidewalk were holding the corners of a large bedsheet, which was weighed down with a heap of coins and bills. Others were coming from every direction to throw in more money. I stopped momentarily to watch and realized that the people were soliciting contributions for Israel's war effort. It struck me that while my family and many others were preoccupied with the fate of Palestine, Lots of New Yorkers were just as worried about the outcome for Israel. They sincerely believed that the Jewish state was in danger of extinction, as did many Israelis, alarmed by the empty threats of certain Arab leaders. President Lyndon B. Johnson knew otherwise. When Abba Eben, Israel's foreign minister, told Johnson at a meeting in Washington, D.C., on May 26 that Egypt was about to launch an attack, the president asked his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, to set the record straight. Three separate intelligence groups had looked carefully into the matter, McNamara said, and it was our best judgment that an attack was not imminent. All of our intelligence people are unanimous, Johnson added, that if Egypt were to attack, you will whip hell out of them. As Washington knew, Israel's military in 1967 was far superior to the militaries of all the Arab states combined, as it was in every other contest between them. Government documents published since then have confirmed these judgments. U.S. military and intelligence sources predicted a crushing victory by Israel in any and all circumstances, given the mastery enjoyed by its armed forces. Five years after the 1967 war, five Israeli generals echoed the U.S. assessment, stating in different venues that Israel was not imperiled by annihilation. On the contrary, its forces were much stronger than the Arab armies in 1967, and the country was never in any danger of losing a war, even if the Arabs had struck first. Yet the myth prevails, in 1967, a tiny, vulnerable country faced constant, existential peril, and it continues to do so. This fiction has served to justify blanket support of Israeli policies, no matter how extreme, and despite its repeated rebuttal even by authoritative Israeli voices. The war unfolded much as the CIA and Pentagon had foreseen. A lightning first strike by the Israeli Air Force destroyed most Egyptian, Syrian, and Jordanian warplanes on the ground. This gave Israel complete air superiority, which, in that desert region, in that season, provided an absolute advantage to its ground forces. Israeli armored columns thus were able to conquer the Sinai Peninsula and the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, including Arab East Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights in six days. If the reasons for Israel's decisive victory in June 1967 are clear, 
the factors that led to the war are less so. A key cause was the rise of militant Palestinian commando groups. The Israeli government had recently begun to divert the waters of the Jordan River to the center of the country, despite great Arab popular distress and even greater impotence on the part of the Arab regimes. On January 1, 1965, Fatah launched an attack to sabotage a water pumping station in central Israel. This was intended as a strike of symbolic significance, the first of many, designed to show that the Palestinians could act effectively when the Arab governments could not, and to embarrass those governments and force them to act. Fatah was regarded with suspicion by Egyptian officials as a loose cannon, recklessly provoking Israel at a time when Egypt was heavily engaged in military intervention in a civil war in Yemen, and in building up its economy. This was at the height of what the scholar Malcolm Kerr called the Arab Cold War, when Egypt led a coalition of radical Arab nationalist regimes opposed to the conservative bloc headed by Saudi Arabia. The flashpoint of their rivalry was Yemen, where a revolution against the monarchy in 1962 led to a civil war in which much of Egypt's military became entangled, given Israel's overwhelming military superiority and the fact that more than 60,000 Egyptian troops and much of its air force were tied down in the Yemeni civil war, Egypt's provocation of Israel in May 1967, by moving troops into the Sinai Peninsula and requesting the removal of UN peacekeeping forces, appears illogical. But Egypt was responding to an upsurge of Palestinian guerrilla raids on Israel from bases provided by the radical new Syrian regime that had come to power in 1966, to which Israel had reacted by attacking and threatening Syria. The Egyptian leadership felt obliged to answer this challenge to maintain its prestige in the Arab world. Point eight, whatever its motives, Egypt's moves in Sinai constituted overt incitement of Israel. Moreover, they provided the casus belli that allowed the Israeli military to launch a long-planned first strike, one that smashed three Arab armies and changed the face of the Middle East. Every morning during the war, I headed down to the UN, changing my route to avoid the bedsheet fundraisers, to my father's 35th floor office, with its panoramic view of the East River and Queens. He worked in the Division of Political and Security Council Affairs and one of his jobs was to report on the Council's Middle East deliberations. So he sat in on Security Council meetings whenever the Arab-Israeli conflict was discussed, which meant about half of its sessions during the decade and a half that he worked there, until he died in 1968. At his office, I listened to the radio, read the news, and generally tried to make myself useful until the council was called into session. I was then able to sit in the visitor's gallery while my father would take his seat in the last row, behind the assistant secretary general in charge of his division. This particular official, by some arcane early Cold War deal that perhaps went back to Yalta, was always a Russian, a Belarusian, or a Ukrainian. The council had been in formal or informal session repeatedly since the crisis had begun in earnest the preceding month. During the six days of the war itself, the council held eleven sessions, many of them running into the early hours of the morning. The pace and the workload were grueling, and my father, who with his colleagues had to spend many hours preparing materials for the council and secretary-general, and then drafting reports on each session, looks haggard and drawn in photos taken at that time. By Friday June 9, the fifth day of the war, Israeli forces had decisively defeated the Egyptian and Jordanian armies and occupied the Gaza Strip, the Sinai Peninsula, the West Bank, and Arab East Jerusalem. Early that morning Israel had begun storming the Golan Heights, routing the Syrian army, and was advancing rapidly along the main road toward Damascus. The council had ordered comprehensive ceasefires on June 6 and 7, but Israeli forces entering Syria ignored these resolutions, even as their government loudly proclaimed its adherence to them. By that night in the Middle East, still afternoon in New York, 
Israel's forces were approaching the key provincial capital of Cunitra, beyond which stood only the flat Horan plain between their armored columns and the Syrian capital, just 40 miles away. Early in the council session, which started at 12.30 p.m., the Soviet Union proposed a draft of a third and more urgent ceasefire resolution. At this point, after the humiliating defeat of the Soviet-equipped Egyptian army and the seizure of the Golan Heights, the Soviets were desperate to protect their Syrian clients from further reverses, especially from an Israeli march on Damascus. The urgency was reflected in the increasingly testy interventions in the debate by Ambassador Nikolai Fedorenko, the Soviet representative. The resolution, SC-235, which passed unanimously at about 1.30 p.m., demanded of all the parties to the conflict that hostilities should cease forthwith. Unusually, it also called on the UN Secretary-General to arrange immediate compliance with the ceasefire and report back to the Council not later than two hours from now. As the session wore on into the afternoon, I fidgeted nervously waiting for the secretary-general's confirmation of compliance with the ceasefire. This would signal that the fighting had been brought to an end and the Israeli advance had been halted. But as the minutes ticked by, fresh reports kept coming in of Israeli troops getting closer and closer to Damascus. It seemed as if the council might have been on the point of taking some action to enforce its demand for an immediate ceasefire, when Ambassador Arthur Goldberg, the U.S. representative, asked for an adjournment. After a desultory discussion, the Council agreed to adjourn for two hours, and the delegations slowly filed out of the chamber. I rushed down to meet my father, expecting him to explain why the Council had agreed to allow another two hours of delay. Goldberg wanted to consult with his government, my father told me flatly. I was incredulous. How much consultation was needed to impose a ceasefire resolution? With a strange, bitter smile, my father responded dispassionately in Arabic. Don't you understand, he said. The Americans are giving the Israelis a little more time. Thanks to Ambassador Goldberg's maneuver to delay implementation of the June 9 ceasefire resolution for a few extra hours, the Israeli advance into Syria did not stop and it continued until the following afternoon. By then, the Security Council had spent nine more hours in acrimonious debate stretching over three more sessions, and running into the early hours of June 10. Throughout, Goldberg had reprised his delaying tactics. Minor though the incident was, the ambassador's performance betokened a major shift in the United States' policies toward Israel. What we had witnessed that day was evidence of a new Middle Eastern axis in action. The armored spearheads on the ground were Israeli, while the diplomatic cover was American. It is an axis that is still in place today, over a half-century later. The shift, which had been underway for some time, was mainly due to global factors, notably the impact of the Cold War and the Vietnam War on the region and on U.S. policy but also to significant personal and political considerations in Washington, D.C. Evolving in parallel were Israel's external alliances, whereby it decisively moved away from its patrons of the 1950s and early 1960s, France and Britain, with whose weapons it fought the 1956 and 1967 wars, to a complete alignment with the United States. All of these factors had coalesced by June 1967, before the start of the war, when the Israeli government sought and received a green light from Washington to launch a preemptive attack on the air forces of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. If the Balfour Declaration and the Mandate constituted the first declaration of war on the Palestinian people by a great power, and the 1947 UN resolution on the partition of Palestine represented the second one. The aftermath of the 1967 war produced the third such declaration. It came in the form of SC-242, a resolution crafted by the United States and approved on November 22, 1967.
U.S. policy toward Israel and Palestine had not followed a straight line in the 20 years between the passage of these two resolutions. In the years that followed the 1948 war, the Truman and Eisenhower administrations had tried rather tepidly and without success to persuade Israel to offer some concessions to its defeated adversaries. Their efforts focused on the return to their homes of the 750,000 or so Palestinian refugees, whose property had been seized by Israel, and on reducing the expansive borders Israel had achieved through its victories in the 1948 war. These feeble American attempts petered out in the face of the obduracy of David Ben-Gurion, who rejected concessions on both points. The Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy administrations maintained close relations with Israel, extending economic aid to the new state, although they did not see it as a principal element in their regional policies and did not approve of all of its actions. Eisenhower had forced Israel's withdrawal from Sinai and the Gaza Strip after the 1956 Suez War, and later Kennedy tried and failed to prevent Israel from developing nuclear weapons. In the early 1960s Kennedy came to see Arab nationalism and Egypt's Nasser as a bulwark against communism, which was the prime American concern in the Middle East. This was in part because of events in Iraq, where the regime of ABD al karim Qasim was supported by the Iraqi Communist Party and the USSR, but vigorously opposed by Egypt and its nationalist allies. With Kennedy's assassination and the advent of the Johnson administration in December 1963, new elements intervened. As the war in Southeast Asia intensified, Johnson's government was ever more inclined to see other parts of the world in rigid Cold War terms. Partly in consequence, U.S.-Egyptian relations deteriorated markedly as the Yemeni civil war that had begun in 1962 turned into a major regional conflict. The USSR and its allies backed the Yemeni Republican regime, which relied upon a large Egyptian expeditionary force, while the United States, Britain, Israel, and their allies upheld the Saudi-supported royalists. By 1967, U.S. relations with Egypt were much colder than they had been under Kennedy, and the Middle East was polarized along lines of the Arab Cold War with Egypt and Saudi Arabia as its antagonistic poles. This conflict increasingly ran parallel to the larger global Cold War, but it had its own regional specificities. These included an ideological struggle not between communism and capitalism, but rather between the authoritarian Arab nationalism promoted by Egypt and the political Islam, centered on Wahhabism and absolute monarchy that was purveyed by Saudi Arabia under King Faisal. The realignment of American Middle Eastern priorities was also affected by President Johnson's long-standing and overt sympathy for Israel. As Senate Majority Leader in 1956, he had opposed Eisenhower's pressure on Israel to withdraw from Sinai and the Gaza Strip. Johnson was also relatively unfamiliar with Middle Eastern and other global realities. By contrast, Kennedy, the worldly and wealthy son of an ambassador, had visited Palestine in the early summer of 1939, when he was a 22-year-old Harvard student, and sent his father a letter in which he demonstrated a reasonably good grasp of the facts and a skeptical assessment of the main arguments of both sides in the conflict. This skepticism made Kennedy less susceptible than most American politicians to the pressures applied by Israel's supporters. Lyndon Johnson, on the other hand, came from a much more modest background and his primary interests had revolved around domestic politics. His strong affinity with Zionism and Israel was reflected in his circle of close friends and advisors, which included such supporters of Israel as Abe Fortas, whom he made a Supreme Court Justice, Arthur Goldberg, McGeorge Bundy, Clark Clifford, and the brothers Eugene and Walter Rostow. All were devoted backers of the Jewish state whose sympathies had to some extent been held in check by Kennedy. Other avid Israel boosters who were personally close to Johnson were also major donors to the Democratic Party, 
such as Abraham Feinberg and Arthur Krim, and the latter's wife, Dr. Mathilde Krim, a renowned scientist who had once smuggled weapons and explosives for the revisionist Zionist terror group, the Ergen. Although Johnson had inherited most of Kennedy's foreign policy advisors, they had considerably more prominence in an administration led by a president with less experience and assurance in world affairs than Kennedy had. These political and personal factors combined in the three years leading up to the 1967 war to prepare the way for the ensuing shift in U.S. policy. Israel, for its part, had been stung by the strong American opposition to its 1956 Suez adventure. As it prepared in 1967 for a first strike against the Arab Air Forces, its leaders were determined to get prior American approval for their action, which they indeed obtained. A crucial exchange took place at a meeting in Washington on June 1, 1967, during which Major General Mayer Amit, the head of the Mossad, Israel's external intelligence agency, told Secretary of Defense McNamara that he was going to recommend to his own government that Israel launch an attack. He asked the Secretary for assurances that the United States would not react negatively. According to Amit, McNamara replied, all right, said he would tell the president, and asked only how long the war would last and what Israeli casualties might be. Johnson and McNamara had already heard from their military and intelligence advisors that the Arabs were not going to attack, and that in any case Israel was likely to win an overwhelming victory. The Israeli military now had the green light it needed to launch a long-planned preemptive strike. The United States facilitated Israel's first strike in other ways. At a small meeting of Arab UN officials and diplomats after the war, Mohammed El Farah, Jordan's ambassador, told the group that he felt he had been the victim of American duplicity in the run-up to the war. Ambassador Goldberg, he said, had conveyed to Arab ambassadors that the United States was mediating with Israel to defuse the crisis and would restrain it from attacking, while he urged them to counsel restraint to their governments. The Johnson administration had given Israel the go-ahead for its surprise attack, El Farah said, just before Egypt's vice president arrived in Washington for negotiations to resolve the crisis. The Arab ambassadors had been used to deceive their governments, he felt, while Israel prepared its first strike with U.S. approval. No less important was that given this shift in U.S. policy, Israel could count on President Johnson and his advisors to prevent a repetition of the pressure that had forced a withdrawal from its 1956 conquests. This was a complete transformation of the U.S. stance in 1956 on Israeli control of conquered Arab territory, and its ramifications were disastrous for the Palestinians. The result of this new tolerance for Israeli territorial gains was Security Council Resolution 242. Its text was largely drafted by the British permanent representative, Lord Carradine, but in essence, it distilled the views of the United States and Israel and reflected the weakened position of the Arab states and their Soviet patron, after the crushing June defeat. Although SC-242 stressed the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war, it linked any Israeli withdrawal to peace treaties with the Arab states and the establishment of secure frontiers. In practice, this meant that any withdrawals would be both conditional and delayed, given the Arab states' reluctance to engage in direct negotiations with Israel. Indeed, in the case of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights, full withdrawals have not taken place for over half a century, in spite of decades of sporadic indirect and direct negotiations. Moreover, by linking Israel's withdrawal from occupied territories to the creation of secure and recognized boundaries, SC-242 allowed for the possibility of enlarged Israeli borders to meet the criterion of security as determined by Israel. This nuclear-armed regional superpower has subsequently deployed an extraordinarily expansive and flexible interpretation of the term. Finally, 
the ambiguous language of SC-242 left open another loophole for Israel to retain the territories it had just occupied. The resolution's English text specifies, withdrawal from territories occupied, in the 1967 war rather than, from the territories occupied. Abba Eben pointedly stressed to the Security Council that his government would regard the original English language text as binding, rather than the equally official French version, whose wording, de territoires a cups, does not permit this ambiguity. In the half century since, with American help, Israel has driven a coach and horses through this linguistic gap, which has permitted it to colonize the occupied Palestinian and Syrian territories some of which, East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights, it has formally annexed, and to maintain its unending military control over them. Repeated United Nations condemnations of these moves, unsupported by even a hint of sanctions or any genuine pressure on Israel, have over time amounted to tacit international acceptance of them. The United States was now more squarely on the side of Israel than it had been previously which meant the abandonment of the semblance of balance shown at times by the Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy administrations. This was the beginning of what became the classical period of the Arab-Israeli conflict, lasting until the end of the Cold War, during which the United States and Israel developed a unique full-scale, albeit informal, alliance based essentially on Israel showing itself in 1967 as a reliable partner against perceived Soviet proxies, in the Middle East. For the Palestinians, this near-total alignment brought another forceful intervention by a great power to the detriment of their rights and interests, and gave a renewed international imprimatur to a further stage in their dispossession. As in 1947, a new international legal formula harmful to the Palestinians came via the medium of a UN resolution, and as with the Balfour Declaration of 1917, the key document contains not a single mention of Palestine or the Palestinians. Security Council Resolution 242 treated the entire issue as a state-to-state -state matter between the Arab countries and Israel, eliminating the presence of Palestinians. The text does not refer to the Palestinians or to most elements of the original Palestine question. Instead, it contains a bland reference to a just solution of the refugee problem. If the Palestinians were not mentioned and were not a recognized party to the conflict, they could be treated as no more than a nuisance, or at best as a humanitarian issue. Indeed, after 1967, their existence was acknowledged mostly under the rubric of terrorism purveyed by Israel, and eventually adopted by the United States. By its omissions, Resolution 242 consecrated a crucial element of Israel's negationist narrative. Since there were no Palestinians, the only genuine issue was that the Arab states refused to recognize Israel and wielded a phantom, Palestine problem, as a pretext for this refusal. In the discursive battle over Palestine, which Zionism had dominated since 1897, UNSC 242 gave validity to this brilliant fabrication, delivering a powerful blow to the displaced and occupied Palestinians. Only two years later, in 1969, Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir famously proclaimed that, there were no such thing as Palestinians, they did not exist, and that they never had existed. She thereby took the negation characteristic of a settler colonial project to the highest possible level. The indigenous people were nothing but a lie. Perhaps most important, Resolution 242 effectively legitimated the 1949 armistice lines, since known as the 1967 borders or the Green Line, as Israel's de facto boundaries thereby indirectly consenting to its conquest of most of Palestine in the 1948 war. The failure to refer to core issues dating back to 1948 extended to ignoring the right of the Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and obtain compensation, another blow to their aspirations. With Resolution 242, the UN was walking away from its own commitment to these rights, 
consecrated by the General Assembly in Resolution 194 in December 1948. Once again, the Palestinians were being dealt with by the great powers in a cavalier fashion, their rights ignored, deemed not worthy of mention by name in the key international decision meant to resolve the conflict and determine their fate. This slight further motivated the Palestinians' reviving national movement to put its case and cause before the international community, thanks in large part to SC-242, a whole new layer of forgetting, of erasure and mythmaking, was added to the induced amnesia that obscured the colonial origins of the conflict between Palestinians and the Zionist settlers. The resolution's exclusive focus on the results of the 1967 war made it possible to ignore the fact that none of the underlying issues resulting from the 1948 war had been resolved in the intervening 19 years. Along with the expulsion of the Palestinian refugees, the refusal to allow them to return, the theft of their property, and the denial of Palestinian self-determination. These included the legal status of Jerusalem and Israel's expansion beyond the 1947 partition frontiers. As for the core problems arising from the original usurpation of Palestine, SC-242 did not even refer to them, much less offer any solutions. Yet the resolution henceforth became the benchmark for resolving the entire conflict, nominally accepted by all parties even as it passed over the basic aspects of the conflict in silence. In view of the resolution's perverse genesis, it is not surprising that over 50 years after it was adopted, UNSC 242 remains unimplemented and the essence of the struggle over Palestine remains unaddressed. Indeed, SC 242 exacerbated the problem. Confining the conflict to its post, 1948 state-to-state -state dimensions made it possible to split the challenges facing Israel into separate bilateral state-to-state -state compartments, each of which could be dealt with in isolation, as Israel and the United States preferred, while ignoring the most difficult and uncomfortable questions. Instead of being obliged to confront a, nominally, unified Arab position and engage the tough issues relating to the Palestinians, Israel now had the far easier task of dealing on a bilateral basis, with the grievances of individual Arab states whose territory it had occupied, while sidelining the Palestinians. In Israel's effort to divide its enemies and deal with them separately, the United States was of enormous help using its power and influence to play on the Arab state's weaknesses and rivalries. This was seen as being in the U.S. interest, too. Characteristically, Henry Kissinger put this pithily, speaking of another Middle Eastern crisis, the end result would be exactly what we have worked all these years to avoid, it would create Arab unity. The United States had multiple reasons to prevent such unity, primarily to fend off threats to its regional dominance, and in particular to the fragile oil autocracies of the Gulf with which it was closely aligned. Following the push by the United States and Israel for bilateral settlements, Egypt in the 1970s and then Jordan in the 1990s negotiated separate peace treaties with Israel. These countries were thereby removed from the conflict leaving Israel in an even stronger position to deal with its more intractable foes, the Syrians, the Lebanese, and of course the Palestinians. To most people in the Arab world, however, the stark contrast between Arab normalization with Israel and the misery that its colonization and occupation inflicted on the Palestinians inevitably undermined any faith in an American-sponsored peace process. In and of itself, SC-242 did not force the Arab states to accept the bilateralization and fragmentation of the conflict. Other factors were at work, among them the impact of Egypt's defeat in 1967, its subsequent withdrawal from Yemen, both of which marked the end of its attempt to assert regional hegemony. Egypt's diminution left its rival Saudi Arabia as the dominant actor in the Arab world a situation that continues to the present day. The failure of the Arab socialist model adopted by the authoritarian nationalist regimes, 
and the pronounced regional weakness of the USSR, also played a role in their capitulation. At different times, encouraged by the United States, the Arab countries walked into the trap of separate settlements with open eyes, eventually abandoning any semblance of unity or even minimal coordination. Even the Palestinians, represented by the PLO, eventually traveled down the path laid out in SC 242. Only a few years after the Arab states accepted 242 and the bilateral approach as a basis for a resolution of the conflict, the PLO leadership followed. There is another side to the story of what happened in 1967, however. For all the harm the war in SC 242 did to the Palestinians, they ultimately served as the spark to their reviving national movement, which had been declining since the defeat of the 1936-39 revolt. The process of revival had started well before the 1967 war, of course, playing a crucial role in precipitating that and the 1956 war. Still, 1967 marked an extraordinary resurgence of Palestinian national consciousness and resistance to Israel's negation of Palestinian identity, a negation made possible by the complicity of much of the world community. In the words of one seasoned observer, a central paradox of 1967 is that by defeating the Arabs, Israel resurrected the Palestinians. The resurrection of the idea of Palestine faced an uphill battle, in the wake of the 1967 war in most parts of the world. The year after the war, I joined a tiny demonstration to protest the appearance of Golda Meir, who had been invited to speak at Yale Law School. She was rapturously received by a large and appreciative audience, while, as I recall it, our demonstration consisted of a total of four protesters, myself, a Lebanese-American friend, a Sudanese graduate student, and one American who had lived in the Middle East. That scene accurately represented the balance between Israel and Palestine in American opinion. The Zionist narrative enjoyed complete dominance while the very word Palestine was almost unmentionable. In Beirut, on the other hand, where I now spent the summers with my mother and brothers, I was witness to an important resurgence of Palestinian political agency. Writers and poets both throughout the Palestinian diaspora and living inside Palestine, Ghassan Kanafani, Mahmoud Darwish, Emil Habibi, Fadwa Tukin, and Tafik Zayad, together with other gifted and engaged artists and intellectuals, played a vital role in this renaissance, culturally and politically. Their work helped to reshape a sense of Palestinian identity and purpose that had been tested by the Nakba and the barren years that followed. In novels, short stories, plays, and poetry, they gave voice to a shared national experience of loss, exile, alienation. At the same time, they evinced a stubborn insistence on the continuity of Palestinian identity and steadfastness in the face of daunting odds. These different facets are evident in one of the best known of these works, Emil Habibi's The Pesoptimist a brilliant novella that traces the tragicomic tale of its protagonist, Sa'id, using his fate to portray the plight of the Palestinians and their resilience. The work's full title, The Strange Incidents Around the Disappearance of Sa'id Father of Nas, the Pesoptimist, conveys the essential paradox of the Palestinian situation, happiness, expressed in the name Sa'id, which means happy, and calamity, or Nas. Both are contained in the portmanteau word, pessoptimist. Among the literary figures whose ideas and images played a major role in the revival of Palestinian identity, Kanafani was perhaps the most prominent prose writer and the most widely translated. His five novellas, notably Men in the Sun, 1963, and Return to Haifa, 1969, are widely popular perhaps because they depict so vividly the dilemmas faced by Palestinians, the travails of exile and the pain of life in post-1967 Palestine, now entirely under Israeli control. The novellas encouraged Palestinians to confront their dire predicament and forcefully resist the powers that oppressed them.
Return to Haifa stressed the importance of armed struggle while at the same time poignantly depicting an Israeli Holocaust survivor, living in the home of a Palestinian family that returns to visit after 1967. Kanafani was also a prolific journalist, steeped in Palestinian resistance literature, indeed, he may have coined the term in a collection he published under that title, and he had been deeply involved in politics since his late teens. Born in Acre in 1936, he and his family had been forced to flee their home during the Zionist offensive of May 1948, first settling in Damascus. When I met him in Beirut, he was 33 years old and the editor of Al Hadaf, the weekly magazine of the radical Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, of which Kanafani was also the public spokesman. He won others over not only with his literary talent, but also with his manifest intelligence, his self-deprecating and sardonic sense of humor, and his pleasant, open demeanor and ready smile. In light of his literary renown and militant activism, he was a significant figure in the revived Palestinian national movement. For the same reason, he was a target of the PFLP's enemies, the foremost being the Israeli government and its intelligence services. July 1972 In July 1972, Kanafani was assassinated in a car bombing by the Mossad together with his 17-year-old niece, Lamiz Najm. His enormous funeral, which I attended, drew what seemed to be hundreds of thousands of people mourning him. It was the first of many funerals of Palestinian leaders and militants that I would attend during my 15 years, in Beirut, asterisk. The reshaping and revival of Palestinian identity that Kanafani, Darwish, Zayad, took in. Habibi and others helped to spark with their literary output went in tandem with the rise of new political movements and armed groups. After 1948, Palestine had ceased to exist on the map, with most of the country absorbed into Israel and the rest under the control of Jordan and Egypt. Palestinians had almost no voice, no central address, and no champions other than the bickering, self-interested Arab states. The Zionist movement's deepest desire had been to transform Palestine into Israel and replace the country's indigenous inhabitants with Jewish immigrants. After 1948, it appeared as if the Palestinians had largely disappeared, both physically and as an idea. The Palestinians of course had not disappeared in the years after 1948. The collective trauma of the Nakba had perversely cemented and reinforced their identity, and the small irredentist militant groups that arose in the 1950s had already had a significant impact on the Middle East, having played a role in triggering both the 1956 and 1967 wars. These groups were founded by young middle-class and lower-middle-class radicals, many of whom saw themselves as the progeny of Sheikh, is Aldin al Qassam whose death in battle with the British had been one of the sparks of the 1936 revolt, and who remained a revered symbol of heroic armed militancy. They continued after 1956 to work to re-establish the Palestinians as a regional force and to represent their rights and interests. In the 1960s, these efforts culminated in two main trends. One was led by the movement of Arab nationalists, a pan-Arab organization founded largely by Palestinians, which gave birth in 1967 to the Marxist PFLP. The other was headed by a group formally established in Kuwait in 1959, and which in 1965 publicly announced itself as FATA. The origins of both go back to the late 1940s and early 1950s, when their first leaders were university students or recent graduates. MAN was founded by George Habash, a physician trained at the American University of Beirut who had experienced the Nakba as a young man in LYDD, a town that was depopulated after 1948, resettled with Jewish immigrants, and renamed Lod. Habash set up MAN together with a group of other young Palestinians and Arabs, most of them middle-class professionals like himself and his closest collaborator, Wadi Haddad 
another AUB-trained physician. Habash and his colleagues argued for Arab unity around the question of Palestine as the sole means to reverse the results of the Nakba, after Nasser's Egypt became the standard-bearer for Arab nationalism in the mid-1950s. A close alignment between man and the Egyptian regime developed. Man profited greatly from this alliance, becoming a pan-Arab political force, implanted in countries from Libya and Yemen to Kuwait, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. Egyptian foreign policy benefited as well from its connection with man's widespread network of young militants. Habash, Haddad and their comrades' view of Palestine as the central issue for the Arab world had in large measure been imparted to them. At the American University of Beirut by the historian and intellectual Constantine Zarik through a student organization, Alirwa Alwuthka, of which Zarik was the mentor and to which my father belonged. This influential Syrian-born, Princeton-trained professor of history did much to spread the ideas of Arab nationalism and the centrality of the Palestine issue, in lectures to his students in Beirut and to people across the Arab world through his writings. His short 86-page book, The Meaning of the Catastrophe, was one of the first postmortems of the 1948 defeat, written while the war was ongoing, and featured perhaps the first use of the word Nakba in this context. Zarik argued in it for rigorous, introspective self-criticism of Arab weaknesses and failures, and for Arab coordination and unity as the only means of overcoming the effects of the 1948 disaster. My father studied with Zarik at the AUB in the late 1930s and was strongly influenced by him. Several of Zarik's historical and political books, some inscribed by the author, were in my father's library. When I first met Zarik in the early 1970s in Beirut at the Institute for Palestine Studies, of which he was a co-founder, he urged me and other young historians associated with the IPS to focus on the future. This was more important than history, he seemed to imply, which had already been written by him and his generation. Faced by an upsurge of activist, nationalist sentiment, spurred by Fatah's first military operation, carried out in January 1965, and feeling the need to keep up with one of its core constituencies, Mann was forced to move away from its broad Arab nationalist stance and concentrate more on Palestine. The defeat of Egypt and Syria in 1967 put the last nail in the coffin of Mann's reliance on the Arab regimes. To resolve the question of Palestine.36 the result was the formation of the PFLP by Habash and his colleagues in 1967. Although it was not the largest Palestinian group, the PFLP rapidly became the most dynamic, a stature it maintained for several years. It carried out multiple airplane hijackings in that short time, these were masterminded by Wadi Haddad as were most of what it called its external operations, seen as terrorist attacks by much of the world. Much of the prestige that the group enjoyed among Palestinians was due to the image and integrity of Habash, who was respected even by his political rivals. He was known as Al-Hakim, the doctor, which he was, but the term is also used for someone who is wise, and it was applied to Habash in both senses. He was a riveting speaker, especially in small groups, where his articulate and intellectual approach and his approachable and pleasant effect made the greatest impact. He spoke softly but firmly, with no trace of demagoguery. As I witnessed in South Lebanon in the early 1970s, Habash could keep an audience wrapped for hours, in spite of the complexity of his ideas. With its Marxist-Leninist affinity, the PFLP was popular among students, the educated, the middle class, and particularly those drawn to leftist politics. It also had a dedicated following in the refugee camps, where its radical message resonated strongly with the Palestinians who had suffered the most. Fatah, by contrast, was decidedly non-ideological in its political approach when compared to the PFLP and other avowedly leftist Palestinian groups. At the time of its founding, 
Fata represented a reaction both to the Arab nationalist orientation of groups like Man and the Ba'ath Party, and to communist, leftist, and Islamist groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, which argued for societal change before other problems, notably that of Palestine, could be addressed. Fata's call for direct and immediate action by Palestinians, as well as its broad tent non ideological stance, was one of the factors that rapidly enabled it to become the largest political faction. Some of the details are hazy, but we know that Fatah was founded in Kuwait in 1959 by a group of Palestinian engineers, teachers, and other professionals, headed by Yasser Arafat. The core of the group had coalesced earlier in the Gaza Strip and in the universities of Cairo where it competed with man for leadership of the Union of Palestinian Students. Sulah Caliph, Abu Iyad, once told me an emblematic story about Arafat and university politics in Cairo. In danger of losing a student election the following day to man, Arafat said he had an idea and took Caliph to visit someone he knew at the Egyptian Interior Ministry. They sat drinking tea and coffee and making small talk until the man had to leave his office for a moment, at which point, Arafat leaped up, went behind the official's desk, did something furtive, and returned to his seat. When the man returned, the two took their leave. Caliph objected that they hadn't once brought up the imminent election. Arafat told him to go home, the problem was solved. The next day, Caliph glumly went to the union office to wait out the election only to find an official-looking notice on the door, stamped by Egypt's Ministry of the Interior, ordering the election postponed. This was Arafat's doing, and he used the delay, Caliph said, to enroll Palestinian students studying at Al-Azhar University, many of whom were blind, and none of whom had been courted for their votes by the competing factions. When the election was finally held, they voted en bloc for the FATA list, securing its victory. FATA's main, indeed only, focus was the Palestinian cause. To further this end, FATA called for a campaign of direct armed action against Israel, which it launched on January 1, 1965, with its sabotage attack on the water pumping station in central Israel. Like much of what FATA did in this era, the act was more symbolic than effective. Nonetheless, Egyptian officials considered Fata to be dangerously adventurous at a time when Egypt could ill afford such provocations, across its borders. While Mann and other groups made excuses for the inaction of the nationalist regimes they were associated with, Fata deliberately tried to show up the Arab states for their lack of true commitment to Palestine. This posture infuriated the regimes, especially since Fatah's fervent rhetoric was not matched by much effective armed action, but it went over well with most Palestinians, who were frustrated by the Arab state's lack of engagement. It was also attractive to many Arab citizens, who supported the Palestinians and shared their frustrations. This appeal to public opinion over the heads of the Arab regimes via direct action against Israel was one of the great secrets to the early success of the Palestinian resistance groups, especially Fatah. They spoke to the widespread sense among Arabs that an injustice had been done in Palestine, and that their governments were doing nothing substantive about it. In the years during which this appeal was effective, throughout the 1960s and 1970s, the support for the Palestinian resistance by a broad sector of public opinion served to restrain even undemocratic Arab governments. However, that restraint had severe limits, which were reached when Palestinian militancy threatened the Arab state's domestic status quo or provoked Israel to take action. In the meantime, the small militant groups went from strength to strength and it became clear that a full-scale revival of the Palestinian national movement was underway. By the mid-1960s, this coalescing movement threatened to seize the initiative in the conflict with Israel from the Arab states, and indeed helped to precipitate the events that led to the 1967 war. For all their rhetoric, most of the Arab states, 
Syria being the exception under the ultra-radical regime in power from 1966 to 1970, were preoccupied with other issues and were deeply reluctant to challenge a status quo that heavily favored Israel, whose demonstrated military power they regarded with trepidation. While in the West, Israel still retained its image as a beleaguered victim of Arab hostility. This was far from how it was seen in the Arab world, which instead viewed its decisive military victories and potential possession of nuclear weapons as evidence of towering strength. To co-opt and control the rising tide of Palestinian nationalist fervor, the Arab League, under Egypt's leadership, founded the Palestine Liberation Organization in 1964. This was meant to be a tightly controlled subsidiary of Egyptian foreign policy that would channel and manage Palestinian enthusiasm for striking against Israel, but this attempt to keep the Palestinians under Arab tutelage rapidly unraveled. In the immediate wake of the 1967 war, the militant Palestinian resistance groups took over the PLO, sidelining its Egypt-oriented leadership. Arafat, as the head of Fatah, the largest of these groups, soon became chairman of the PLO Executive Committee, a post he retained, among others, until his death in 2004. Henceforth, the Arab states were obliged to take account of an independent Palestinian political actor, based mainly in the countries bordering Israel, a situation that had already proved problematic for these states and that would eventually become a source of great vulnerability for the Palestinian movement. The rise of this independent actor further complicated the strategic situation of the border states, notably Egypt and Syria, while it constituted a grave domestic problem for Jordan and Lebanon, both of which had large, restive Palestinian refugee populations. For Israel, the re-emergence of the Palestinian national movement as a force in the Middle East and increasingly on the global stage constituted a great irony. Its victory in 1967 had helped to precipitate even more intransigent Palestinian resistance. This constituted a sharp reversal of one of Israel's great successes of the 1948-1967 period, in which the very issue of Palestinian nationhood had almost been fully eclipsed in both arenas. The return of the Palestinians, whose disappearance would have signified a final victory for the Zionist project, was a most unwelcome apparition for Israel's leaders, as unwelcome as the return of any indigenous population would be for a settler colonial enterprise, that believed it had dispensed with them. The comforting idea that the old will die and the young will forget, a remark attributed to David Ben-Gurion, probably mistakenly, expresses one of the deepest aspirations of Israeli leaders after 1948. It was not to be. While the Palestinian resurgence posed little or no threat to Israel in strategic terms, although the attacks by militant groups did create serious security problems, it constituted an entirely different kind of challenge on the discursive level, one that was existential. The ultimate success of the Zionist project as hardline Zionists defined it depended in large measure on the replacement of Palestine by Israel. For them, if Palestine existed, Israel could not. Israel was in consequence obliged to focus its powerful propaganda machine on a new target, while still having to counter the efforts of the Arab states. Since from the Zionist vantage point the name Palestine and the very existence of the Palestinians constituted a mortal threat to Israel, the task was to connect these terms indelibly, if they were mentioned at all, with terrorism and hatred, rather than with a forgotten but just cause. For many years, this theme was the core of a remarkably successful public relations offensive, especially in the United States. Finally, the re-emergence of the Palestine question posed a problem for U.S. diplomacy, which with SC-242 had chosen to ignore it and act as if the Palestinians did not exist. For a decade thereafter, the United States strove to keep its head in the sand, even as much of the international community began to extend to the Palestinian movement some degree of recognition.
This U.S. stance was in keeping with pronounced Israeli preferences, and it was made possible by the inadequate representation by the Palestinians of their own cause in the U.S. arena, and the weakness of pro-Palestinian sentiment in American public opinion. At the same time, administrations from that of Nixon onward also gave various forms of covert and overt support to military action, directed against the PLO by Israel, Jordan, Lebanese factions, and Syria. By managing to impose themselves on the map of the Middle East in spite of the best efforts of Israel, the United States, and many Arab governments, the Palestinians succeeded in reacquiring something long denied to them what Edward said called the permission to narrate. This meant the right to tell their story themselves, taking back control of it not only from Israel's omnipresent narrative in the West, in which the Palestinians scarcely figured except as villains, as in Exodus, for example, but also from the Arab governments. For many years, the Arab states had taken charge of the Palestinian side of the story as their own relating it feebly as a conflict between Israel and themselves over borders and refugees. One aspect of the rapid ascent in the fortunes of their national movement that has been overlooked is the effectiveness of the Palestinians' communications strategy in the Arab countries, in the developing world, and to a lesser extent in Europe and the West. At the UN, where third world countries by the 1960s had a much bigger presence, this translated into a more favorable environment for the Palestine cause. In consequence, the historic gap between the Zionists' success in shaping world public opinion and Palestinian ineptness in this sphere began to narrow, partly due to an increase in the number of Palestinians steeped in Western culture or with experience in other parts of the globe. In the Arab world, the movement received an enormous boost in March 1968, nine months after the war, in Karameh, a small Jordanian town, whose name by fortuitous coincidence means dignity. In Israel's biggest military operation since the war, about 15,000 troops with armor, artillery, and air support crossed the Jordan River to eliminate a concentration of Palestinian fighters based in and around Karameh. The attackers unexpectedly met fierce resistance from the Jordanian army and the PLO, which inflicted between 100 to 200 casualties on the seemingly invincible Israeli army, and forced it to abandon a number of damaged tanks, armored personnel carriers, and other equipment. In the wake of the disastrous war barely a year earlier, this relatively small engagement, in which the Israelis seemed to leave the battlefield in disarray, electrified the Arab world and revolutionized the image of the Palestinians. Although it was Jordanian artillery and armor, positioned in the hills overlooking the Jordan River Valley, which undoubtedly inflicted the most damage on Israel's forces, the Palestinians fighting inside Karameh reaped most of the glory from this episode. The Battle of Karameh proved to be a godsend to the propaganda of the Palestinian resistance movement which effectively publicized the clash as a stand for Arab dignity, trampled underfoot as it had been by the failures of the Arab regimes. As a result, the Palestinian resistance was lionized throughout the Arab world. The irony of this self-presentation was that at its height, the PLO never posed any kind of military challenge to Israeli forces, which defeated all the Arab armies in the field in every one of their conventional wars. Even when PLO forces fought well defensively, as at Karameh, they were rarely capable of going head-to-head -head for very long with one of the most experienced, well-trained, and best-equipped militaries in the world. Moreover, from the beginning of the Palestinian armed struggle in the 1960s until the PLO later renounced this approach, they never were able to develop a successful guerrilla war strategy. That might have countered the superiority of Israel's conventional forces or the limitations of being based in Arab countries, vulnerable to Israeli military pressure. In fact, the PLO's greatest success in its heyday during the late 1960s and 1970s came in the realm of diplomacy, despite the United States' refusal to engage with the Palestinians.
This was visible not only in the Arab world and the Eastern Bloc, which extended limited support to the PLO from the late 1960s onward, but also in much of the Third World, many countries of Western Europe, and even at the UN, Resolution 242 notwithstanding. In the General Assembly, the PLO could now muster majorities that were immune to the veto that the U.S. wielded in the Security Council. There and in other arenas, the PLO achieved a high level of diplomatic recognition, even succeeding to some small degree in isolating Israel. The PLO was recognized by the Arab League in 1974, as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people while simultaneously opening PLO missions in more than 100 countries. The invitation to Yasser, Arafat to speak before the UN General Assembly that same year was the greatest diplomatic success in Palestinian history. After so many decades of non-recognition by the League of Nations, the UN, and the Great Powers. There were different reasons for these limited triumphs. This was an era when successful national liberation movements in Algeria, Southern Africa, and Southeast Asia garnered support, including among young people, in the West. The PLO's anti-colonial and Third World revolutionary appeal also resonated with China, the Soviet Union and its satellites, with Third World countries, and among those countries' representatives at the UN. In most of the newly independent countries of Asia and Africa, the Palestinians were seen as another people struggling against a colonial settler project backed by the Western powers. They therefore deserved the sympathy of those who themselves had just thrown off the colonial yoke. At the height of the Vietnam War, these themes had great appeal to disaffected youth in Europe and the United States. Finally, the PLO succeeded to some extent in galvanizing the Palestinian and Arab diaspora in the Americas, who became advocates for the national cause. Yet all of these efforts had severe limitations. Among them were the PLO's failure to devote sufficient energy, talent, and resources to diplomacy and information, despite the gains made in these areas. Nor did the PLO work hard enough at understanding their target audiences, the most crucial of them being the United States and Israel. There, the PLO ultimately failed to overcome a more effective competing narrative generated by Israel and its supporters, that equated Palestinian with terrorist. The PLO's incapacity to understand the importance of these two vital arenas started with its top leadership. Respected Palestinian American academics in the United States, notably Edward Said, Ibrahim Abu Lughad, Walid Khalidi, Hisham Sharabi, Fouad Mufrabi, and Sami Farsoun, repeatedly tried to impress on Palestinian leaders that they needed to take American public opinion into account and devote to it sufficient resources and energy, but to no avail. At a 1984 meeting in Amman of the Palestine National Council, PNC, the PLO's governing body, a U.S.-based group in which I participated strove to make this point to Yasser Arafat. He agreed to meet us and listened courteously until, after only a couple of minutes, an aide came in and whispered in his ear. We were hurriedly ushered out while Arafat received one Abu al-Abbas, the leader of the Palestine Liberation Front, a tiny insignificant faction that caused great damage to the Palestinian cause, but was on Iraq's payroll. Our audience was over and the opportunity for us Palestinian Americans to make the case for the importance of appealing to U.S. public opinion evaporated. In the PLO leadership's misplaced priorities, the Inter-Arab Balancing Act at which Arafat excelled was more pressing than was furthering the Palestine cause with the public of the preeminent global superpower. Notwithstanding this failure, the Palestinian cause did make some progress in the United States after 1967. This was largely thanks to the efforts of the same group of Palestinian American academics, who were effective in putting the Palestinian narrative before college campuses, the alternative media and other sectors of public opinion. Edwards said in particular had an outsized impact, 
articulately making a case for the Palestinians in ways that his audiences had never heard before. While he and his Palestinian-American colleagues were unable to achieve a breakthrough with the mainstream media, which by and large continued to repeat the Israeli line, they laid the groundwork for an increased understanding of the Palestinian perspective in future years. As the PLO appeared to go from one diplomatic and propaganda victory to another after 1967, these successes did not go uncontested, each one provoking ferocious opposition from its many foes. Israel's raid on Karame was one of its first efforts to counter the PLO's growing status. A devastating raid on the Beirut airport in 1968 was another. In 1970, the PFLP's aircraft hijackings and Palestinian excesses in Jordan precipitated a disastrous confrontation with the Hashemite regime that the resistance movement was in no position to win. Facing superior force, and having lost some popular sympathy, the movement was driven from Amman that year in what became known as Black September, and then completely expelled from Jordan in the spring of 1971. One of the casualties of the Jordan debacle was the aura of successful dynamism that some components of the movement, notably the PFLP, had maintained until that point. The resistance movement's pattern of recklessly provoking its enemies, alienating its hosts, and ultimately being expelled was to be repeated in Beirut eleven years later. Meanwhile, Israel carried out further punishing attacks on Syria and Lebanon countries from which the Palestinians continued to launch military operations. These included a major ground incursion into South Lebanon in 1972, an aerial bombardment in 1974 of the Nabatea Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon, which was completely destroyed and never rebuilt, and an invasion that resulted in the long-term occupation of parts of South Lebanon in 1978. All these moves against the PLO benefited from strong U.S. support, both the Israeli and Jordanian militaries received American arms, and both countries were able to count on full U.S. diplomatic backing. The United States reacted to the increased visibility of the PLO and to what seemed to be a unified Arab bloc, in another way, as well. Given the USSR's support for the PLO and the Arab bloc, President Nixon and his national security adviser and later Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, expended great efforts to weaken the Soviet Union's links to what they saw as its Arab clients in the Middle East. The centerpiece of this Cold War strategy was the American attempt to prize Egypt away from the USSR, align it with the US, and induce it to agree to a separate peace settlement with Israel. When this American-led initiative finally succeeded in the late 1970s, under the Carter administration, it had the effect of splitting the, nominally, unified Arab Front and leaving the Palestinians and other Arab actors to face Israel in a much weaker position. In all of this, the United States stuck to the lines laid down in SC 242, which excluded the Palestinians from any share in the negotiations for a settlement. U.S. policymakers were guided by their hostility to the PLO because of its militancy and its alignment with the USSR, but also by Israel's intense opposition to discussion of any aspect of the Palestine question. Thereafter, the PLO was trapped in a dilemma. How could it achieve Palestinian national aspirations through participation in a Middle East peace settlement, when the internationally recognized terms for such a settlement, SC-242, negated these aspirations? It was a dilemma remarkably similar to that posed by the Balfour Declaration and the Palestine Mandate. In order to be recognized, the Palestinians were required to accept an international formula designed to negate their existence. The small militant groups that relaunched the Palestinian national movement in the 1950s and early 1960s put forward simple objectives for their struggle. For them, Palestine had long been an Arab land with an Arab majority. Its people had been unjustly dispossessed of their homes, their property, their homeland, and their right of self-determination. 
These groups' main purpose was to return the Palestinian people to their homeland, restore their rights, and oust those whom they saw as usurpers. The term a return was central, as it has been for Palestinians ever since. Most felt no sense that there were now two peoples in Palestine, each with national rights, to them Israelis were no more than settlers, foreign immigrants to their country. This position exactly mirrored that of most Israelis, for whom there was only one people with national rights in Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, and that was the Jewish people, while the Arabs were no more than transient interlopers. In the Palestinian reading of the day, Israel was a colonial settler project that the West had helped create and supported, which was largely true, and the Israeli Jews were part of a religious group only, not a people or a nation, which the successful creation of a powerful nation-state with a strong national identity had already shown to be false. At this point, the Palestinians had not come to terms with the reality of a new national entity in Palestine in part because this had happened at their expense and at a ruinous cost to them. The culmination of this thinking about the objectives of the Palestinian struggle was articulated in the National Charter, Al-Mithak al-Watani, adopted by the PLO in 1964. The Charter stated that Palestine was an Arab country where national rights belonged only to those residing there before 1917, and their descendants. This group included Jews then resident in Palestine, but not those who had immigrated after the Balfour Declaration, who would therefore be obliged to leave. From this perspective, liberation involved the reversal of everything that had taken place in Palestine since the Balfour Declaration, the British Mandate, the partition of the country, and the Nakba. It meant turning back the clock and refashioning Palestine into an Arab country once more. Although the ideas the Charter embodied were reflective of much, perhaps most, Palestinian sentiment at the time, it was adopted by a body created by the Arab League, not one that was elected by or represented the Palestinians. These objectives would change rapidly with shifting circumstances and the transformations of Palestinian politics. After 1964, with the takeover of the PLO by Fatah and the other resistance groups in 1968, the national movement formulated a new objective, advocating the idea of Palestine as a single democratic state for all its citizens, both Jews and Arabs. Some iterations referred to a secular democratic state. This was meant to supersede the aims laid down in the National Charter recognizing that Israeli Jews had acquired the right to live in Palestine and could not be made to leave. The change was also meant to refashion the PLO's image and appeal to Israelis, who were treated by the 1964 National Charter as if they did not exist. The statement that Jews and Arabs living in Palestine were entitled to be equal citizens of the country represented a major evolution of the movement's thinking. However, the single democratic state proposal did not recognize the Israelis as a people with national rights, nor did it accept the legitimacy of the state of Israel or of Zionism. Over time, this new objective came to be broadly accepted among Palestinians and was embodied in successive authoritative pronouncements of PLO policy via resolutions of the PNC. In the end, it superseded the charter and rendered it obsolete. Yet these fundamental changes were resolutely ignored by the PLO's opponents, who continued to harp on the Charter's original provisions for decades to come. The change also achieved little traction with most Israelis and failed to convince many in the West. Again, the inability of the PLO leadership to understand how important these audiences were and its unwillingness to devote sufficient resources to explaining the significance of this evolution in order to win them over, doomed any effort to convince others of the validity of these aims. More important, achieving an objective of this magnitude would require the dissolution of Israel with a new state of Palestine taking its place. This would mean overturning what since 1947 had become an international consensus around the existence of Israel as a Jewish state, 
as specified by the wording of GA 181. Only a revolutionary shift in the balance of forces both within Israel and globally could accomplish such an end, something that the Palestinians could hardly achieve or even contemplate on their own. And they could not count on their brothers in the Arab regimes. Radical Arab states such as Syria, Iraq, and Libya continued to talk a big game where the Palestine cause was concerned, but their rhetoric was empty. What these states actually did was to sabotage the PLO by sponsoring nihilistic terrorist groups, such as the Abu Nidal organization, which assassinated numerous PLO leaders and killed Israelis and Jews indiscriminately. As for the other key Arab states, Egypt and Jordan, with the support of Saudi Arabia, had by 1970 accepted SC-242, and Syria followed in 1973. This major development, unacknowledged by Israel, amounted to those states' de facto recognition of Israel, at least within the 1949 armistice lines. The dissonance between this crucial shift by several major Arab states and the PLO's position was to have grave consequences for the Palestinians. Changes in regional circumstances led many PLO leaders to consider a further modification of their objectives. A number of factors exerted an influence, the PLO's inability to sustain an effective guerrilla campaign against Israel after the loss of its bases in Jordan, the Arab state's growing acceptance of the conflict with Israel not as existential but as a state-to-state -state confrontation over frontiers, and Arab and international pressure on the PLO to conform to more limited objectives. At the Arab League summit in Khartoum in 1967, the League had declared that there would be no peace, no recognition, and no negotiations with Israel, the three no's that were much repeated in Israeli propaganda. In reality, Egypt and Jordan welcomed mediation with Israel through UN Special Envoy Gunnar Jaring and later, via US Secretary of State William Rogers. The Khartoum summit notwithstanding, the most powerful Arab country bordering Israel had, by accepting SC-242, conceded in principle that its neighbor had a right to secure and recognized boundaries. It remained only for the Arab states and Israel to negotiate those boundaries and the other terms of a settlement. The Jordanian crackdown on the Palestinians in September 1970, although provoked by the PFLP aircraft hijackings, was meant among other things to punish the Palestinians for not accepting the new limitations of the key Arab states' aims. Starting in the early 1970s, members of the PLO responded to these pressures, in particular to the urging of the Soviet Union, by floating the idea of a Palestinian state alongside Israel, in effect a two-state solution. This approach was notably promoted by the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which had split off from the PFLP in 1969, together with Syrian-backed groups, discreetly encouraged by the leadership of Fatah. Although there had been early resistance to the two-state solution by the PFLP and some Fatah cadres, in time it became clear that Arafat, among other leaders, supported it. This marked the beginning of a long, slow process of shifting away from the maximalist objective of the democratic state, with its revolutionary implications, to an ostensibly more pragmatic aim of a Palestinian state alongside Israel, to be achieved via negotiations on the basis of SC-242. The path toward these radical modifications was not an easy one for the PLO. Only after some of the most severe blows inflicted on the Palestinian national movement since the Nakba, did the PLO come to accept a two-state approach based on SC-242. These blows came in quick succession during the Lebanese Civil War, which began formally in April 1975. However, for the Palestinians the war began two years earlier, on April 10, 1973 with the assassination of three PLO leaders in their homes in West Beirut by Israeli commandos led by Ehud Barak, later Israel's prime minister. The crowds of Palestinians and Lebanese attending the funerals of the poet and PLO spokesman Kamal Nasser, 
and FATA leaders Kamal Adwan and Abu Yusuf Najjar were immense. As I walked with the masses of mourners, I was not surprised to see that they were even larger than those for Ghassan Kanafani. These four men were among the scores of Palestinian leaders and cadres who fell victim to the assassination squads of the Mossad. It is true that nominally Palestinian groups murdered other Palestinian figures, including three members of the Fatah Central Committee and the PLO ambassadors in London and to the Socialist International. These groups served as agents of the three dictatorial Arab regimes, those of Hafez al-Assad in Syria, Saddam Hussein in Iraq, and Muammar al-Qadhafi in Libya, that were loud in their proclamation of support for the Palestinian cause but harsh in their treatment of the PLO. These regimes were patrons at different times of the gunmen of the Abu Nadal organization, which did most of this killing, and other small splinter groups. While the impact of these assassinations by Israel and the hostile Arab powers is a mark of the extraordinarily difficult path, trodden by the Palestinian national movement, there is an important distinction between them. The Arab states that used such means wanted to bend the PLO to their will, even by using brute force, as when the Assad regime sent troops to confront the PLO in Lebanon in 1976. However, they operated on the basis of cold, calculating raison d'etat. They did not want to destroy the PLO or to extinguish the Palestine cause. Israel's case was quite different, as this was always its objective. Its long-standing policy of liquidating Palestinian leaders, inherited from the Zionist movement during the late Mandate period, aimed at eliminating the Palestinian reality, demographically, ideationally, and politically. Assassinations were thus a central element in Israel's ambition to transform the entire country, from the river to the sea, from an Arab to a Jewish one. To use Baruch Kimmerling's term once again, this was an example of politic eyed in its most literal form. As evidence of the extent of the campaign of liquidations, we have two new accounts of it, one of them based on classified Israeli intelligence and military material. Among much else that is new, it contains sensational revelations about repeated attempts to assassinate Yasser. Arafat.41 The pretext that such killings were a blow against a terrorism, simply do not wash when the target is the leader of a national movement, unless the aim is to destroy that movement. Leaders of other anti-colonial movements were invariably vilified by their colonial masters in similar terms. Terrorists, bandits, and murderers, whether they were Irish, Indian, Kenyan, or Algerian. Similarly, Israel's demonization of the PLO as a terrorist served as a justification for its eradication. The private statements of Israeli Defense Minister Ariel Sharon in 1982 about Palestinian terrorists in Beirut could not be clearer on this point. The justification of assassinations as necessary protection against terrorists, who would kill if not killed first, also rings hollow when many of those killed, Ghassan Kanafani and Kamal Nasser, for example or PLO representatives abroad such as Mahmoud Hamshari and Wael Zuader, were intellectuals and advocates for the Palestine cause, rather than military personnel. Their artistic ventures were supplementary and linked to their political activities. Kanafani was a gifted novelist and painter, Nasser a poet, Zuader a writer and budding translator. These were not a terrorists, but the most prominent voices of a national movement, Voices Israel was determined to stifle. In Lebanon, the assassinations of Nasser, Adwan, and Najjar in April 1973 were followed one month later by an armed confrontation with the Lebanese army, during which the Air Force strafed the Palestinian Sabra and Shatila refugee camps in the southern suburbs of Beirut. Throughout the remainder of the Lebanese Civil War, which dragged on until 1990, Palestinian refugee camps and population centers were a frequent target, besieged, devastated, the scenes of massacres and forced expulsions. Tal al-Zatar, Karantina, Bey, Jizr al-Basha, Ain al-Hilwa, Sabra, and Shatila.
Palestinians in all these places suffered such atrocities. The war also brought horrific massacres of Lebanese Christians by factions of the PLO and its Lebanese allies, notably at Damour in January 1976 where hundreds of Christians were killed, and the town was sacked and looted. Tal al-Zatar was the largest, poorest, and most isolated of the Palestinian refugee camps in the Beirut area, with a population of about 20,000 Palestinians and perhaps 10,000 impoverished Lebanese, mainly Shirites from the south. It was located in the East Beirut suburb of Daikwena, which was inhabited largely by Lebanese Maronites sympathetic to the right-wing anti-Palestinian Falangist party. I was living in Beirut with my wife, Mona, in the years leading up to the Civil War, first working on my doctoral dissertation, and then teaching at the Lebanese University and the American University of Beirut. With a group of friends, Palestinian graduate students and residents of Tal al-Zatar, we had opened the first preschool in the camp, backed by Jamiat Inash al makayim a Lebanese-Palestinian charitable organization. Relations between the camp and its surroundings became increasingly fraught as the situation in Lebanon deteriorated, and by May 1973 it was clear that Tal al-Zatar and the nearby Dbay and Jizr al-Basha refugee camps, as well as the Palestinian community in the Karantina area, were in decidedly hostile territory. Their neighbors deeply resented the presence of heavily armed Palestinian militiamen in the camps. In these perilous circumstances, we were all concerned about the safety of the small children in the preschool, so we dug a shelter beneath the center. Several other groups, and eventually the PLO, also built shelters, which saved many lives when the war broke out in earnest in 1975. One Sunday in April that year, Mona and I were having lunch in Tal al-Zatar, at the home of the parents of our friend Kasim when we heard that there had been an incident on the road that led to the camp, which ran through the mainly Maronite suburb of Ain al rumana We were advised to leave immediately. Driving back to West Beirut in our old VW Beetle, we spotted a small bus stopped at an awkward angle in the middle of the road. It had just been ambushed on its way back to Tal al-Zatar by phalangist militiamen, who had killed all of its 27 passengers. It transpired that the phalangists had taken revenge for a shooting at a Maronite church nearby where their leader, Pierre Jamal, had been present. Thus began the 15-year Lebanese civil war. We were never able to return to Tal al-Zatar. Besieged by what came to be called the Lebanese forces, headed by Pierre Jamal's son, Bashir. The camp was overrun in August 1976 and its entire population was expelled. Perhaps 2,000 people were killed in what was probably the largest single massacre during the entire war. Some died during the siege, some when they fled the camp, and some at LF checkpoints, where Palestinians were picked up and taken away to be murdered. Two of the teachers from our preschool were killed in this way, as was Jihad. Kasim's 11-year-old niece, who was kidnapped and murdered at a roadblock together with her mother. The LF carried out the Tal al-Zatar massacre with Israel's covert support. Years later, in 1982, facing parliamentary attacks by Labour Party leaders, Ariel Sharon upheld his conduct during the notorious Sabra and Shatila massacres in September of that year, in which over 1,000 civilians were killed by pointing to the Israeli government's support for the phalangists at the time of the 1976 killings in Tal al-Zatar. In a secret meeting of the Knesset Defense and Foreign Affairs Committee, Sharon revealed that Israel's military intelligence officers, who were on the spot at the time of the Tal al-Zatar massacre, reported that the phalangists were killing people with the weapons we supplied and the forces we helped them build. Sharon went on to say to Shimon Peres, leader of the opposition Labour Party, which had been in power in 1976. You and us are acting according to the same moral principles. The phalangists murdered in Shatila and the phalangists murdered in Tal Zawadar, sick. The link is a moral one, 
should we get involved with the phalangists or not? You supported them and continued to do so after Tal Zawadar. While Israeli military and intelligence officers may not have been inside the camps, as Sharon pointed out to the Knesset committee, they were present at the command posts from which both operations were directed. According to Hassan Sabri Alkoli, the horrified Arab League mediator in Lebanon, who was present in the LF operations room and tried to halt the 1976 massacre as it was taking place, Israeli officers and two Syrian liaison personnel, Colonel Ali Madani and Colonel Mohammed Kohli, were there at the time. Few images are more symbolic of the odds faced by the Palestinians during the Lebanon War than that of Israeli and Syrian officers, whose coexistence in Lebanon had been brokered by Henry Kissinger to a break the back of the PLO, looking on as LF commanders directed a massacre at a Palestinian refugee camp. But as Kissinger said in another context, covert action should not be confused with missionary work. The war in Lebanon had multiple protagonists, Lebanese and non-Lebanese, each one with different objectives, but for a number of them the PLO was a major target. To those Lebanese who opposed the PLO, most of them Maronite Christians, their resistance to the armed Palestinian presence was carried out in the name of Lebanese nationalism and independence. As most Palestinian refugees in Lebanon were Sunni Muslims, and because the secular PLO was allied with Lebanese leftist and Muslim groups, the Maronites feared a disruption of the country's sectarian political system, which the French mandate had rigged in their favor in the early 1920s. To Syria, Lebanon was a vital strategic arena it sought to dominate, a potential point of vulnerability in the conflict with Israel and the site of its struggle with the PLO over leadership of the Arab Front against Israel. These became crucial issues for Damascus as Egypt moved inexorably toward a separate peace with Israel, and in effect became the U.S. client state it has been ever since. While losing its Egyptian ally, Syria needed to find another counterweight to Israel, and domination of Lebanon, the Palestinians, and Jordan may have seemed like the only viable option. The boundless mistrust between the Syrian President Hafez al-Assad and the PLO's Arafat exacerbated the situation, as did the PLO's backing of Lebanese leftist formations, which were thereby enabled to take a position more independent of Damascus. For the Israeli government, indirect and direct involvement in the Lebanon war furnished a welcome opportunity to acquire Lebanese clients, develop a new sphere of influence, and weaken Syria and its allies. Most important, the war provided an opening to retaliate against the PLO's sporadic attacks on Israelis, undermining and perhaps crippling it. This would also neutralize the threat that Palestinian nationalism posed to Israel's permanent control of the occupied territories, where millions more restive Palestinians had come under Israel's rule after 1967. The PLO's attacks launched from Lebanon, which often targeted civilians, gave different Israeli governments all the provocation they needed to justify interventions against their northern neighbor. Israeli methods ranged from direct support in the form of arms and training for the PLO's foes, notably the LF, which received equipment worth $118.5 million and training for 1,300 militiamen. According to an official Israeli source 50, to the assassinations and car bombings that killed Palestinian leaders and countless civilians. Senior Israeli military and intelligence personnel recounted details of some of these operations in a book, in which the chapter on Lebanon is entitled, A Pack of Wild Dogs. The reference is to how Israeli operatives described their allies in the LF which they employed for many of the most gruesome of these lethal operations. The United States supported Israel's goals in Lebanon under Nixon, Ford, and Kissinger, and later under Carter, Vance, and Brzezinski, as well as during the Reagan administration. The two essential objectives of U.S. Middle East policy were to woo the most important Arab state, Egypt, away from the Soviet Union 
while not allowing the Middle East conflict to complicate détente with the USSR. This required steering Egypt toward acceptance of Israel. Egypt's complete alignment with the U.S. would let American leaders claim that they had won the Cold War in the Middle East, while establishing a Pax Americana. Given the magnitude and importance to Washington of these strategic objectives, the PLO's opposition was a relatively minor obstacle, and there were plenty of Middle Eastern parties that were happy to help the United States by acting against it. With the explicit approval of the United States, one of these parties, Syria, launched a direct military assault on the PLO in Lebanon in 1976 as the civil war there was already underway, while Washington and Syria were working toward an understanding about this intervention, Kissinger clarified U.S. objectives, we could let the Syrians move and break the back of the PLO. This was, he said, a strategic opportunity which we shall miss. In the end, the United States did not let the opportunity slip away, and Syrian troops engaged in pitched battles with Palestinian commandos in Sidon and the Shuf Mountains and elsewhere. This Syrian intervention was only made possible after Kissinger persuaded Israel not to oppose it, via a tacit agreement on a red lines that set geographical limits to the Syrian advance. The involvement of the United States in hostilities against the Palestinians long preceded its green light to Syria, in 1976. Henry Kissinger had no place for the PLO or for the resolution of the Palestinian problem in his Cold War, driven framework for the Middle East. For him, the Palestinians, in league with the Soviets and radical Arab regimes, were at worst a hindrance to be removed and at best a problem to be ignored. In furtherance of the American Cold War aims and in his single-minded pursuit of these goals, Kissinger was instrumental in negotiating three important disengagement agreements between Israel and Egypt and Syria, after the 1973 war, which were precursors to a separate Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty. To achieve this, Kissinger sought only to contain the Palestine issue, prevent it from interfering with his diplomacy, and render it manageable, if necessary by the use of force exerted by a range of proxies. This was the case in Jordan from the late 1960s until 1971, and later in Lebanon in the early to mid-1970s, when the PLO opposed Egypt's U.S.-encouraged drift toward a direct settlement with Israel. In both cases, Kissinger colluded with America's local allies to crush the Palestinian movement. Standing behind all of them, in the shadows, often indirectly responsible, was the United States. Still, Kissinger admitted in his memoirs that the Palestinians' fate was, after all, the origin of the crisis, and as anyone who followed his long career can attest, he was nothing if not a pragmatist. Even as he was negotiating the terms of Syria's military intervention against the Palestinians in 1975, Kissinger also authorized covert, indirect talks with the PLO. These contacts were necessarily clandestine because of a pledge the Secretary of State had made in a secret U.S.-Israel memorandum of agreement in September that year. According to this pledge, the United States promised not to recognize or negotiate with the Palestine Liberation Organization until the PLO recognized Israel's right to exist, abjured from the use of force, coded as terrorism, and accepted SC Resolutions 242 and 338, which, passed in 1973, reaffirmed SC 242 and called for negotiations between the parties concerned under appropriate auspices meaning a multilateral peace conference, later convened at Geneva. Notwithstanding this clandestine promise to Israel, soon after Kissinger asked President Gerald Ford to approve U.S. contact with the PLO. He argued that, there would be no change in our position toward the PLO on the Middle East question but we have no commitment to Israel, not to talk to the PLO exclusively about the situation in Lebanon. Ostensibly, the purpose of these contacts was to ensure the security of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut and of American citizens.
during the Lebanese Civil War, which the PLO undertook to do. Over several subsequent years, there was extensive coordination between intelligence personnel from the two sides about such security, provided by the PLO. When these dealings became known, Israel's response was harshly critical, but the U.S. government affirmed their limited nature. However, U.S. PLO contacts rapidly expanded well beyond these original limited aims to encompass the general political situation in Lebanon. In 1977, the U.S. ambassador in Beirut, Richard Parker, was tasked with maintaining contacts regarding a variety of political issues through intermediaries affiliated with the PLO, among them a professor at the AUB and a prominent Palestinian businessman. There can be little question that despite Kissinger's justification, U.S. discussions with the PLO violated the terms of the 1975 Memorandum of Agreement with Israel. Once the Israeli government discovered what was going on, it reacted forcefully to this betrayal, as they saw it. In January 1979, Israeli agents in Beirut assassinated Abu Hassan Salome, the key PLO figure involved in these contacts, by bombing his car, causing a huge explosion that resulted in a ball of fire. Salome had been the head of Yasser Arafat's personal security service, Force 17, and Israel claimed that he had been involved in the 1972 attack on Israeli athletes at the Munich Olympics. However, an account based on interviews with Israeli intelligence officers involved in the operation states that the Mossad eventually reached the conclusion that cutting this channel was important, to give the Americans a hint that this was no way to behave towards friends. The assassination did not end the contacts, although they became even more deeply shrouded in secrecy, as both the United States and the PLO took the heavy-handed Israeli hint. In 1978, John Gunther Dean, Parker's successor as ambassador to Lebanon, was ordered to continue the channels of communication, which broadened to include the first direct interactions between American and PLO officials, and came to address an even wider range of political topics. Among these were the terms for PLO acceptance of SC-242 and for U.S. recognition of the PLO, the inclusion of the PLO in peace negotiations, the Iranian Islamic Revolution and freeing American hostages being held in Tehran. For at least four years, the United States was clandestinely negotiating with the PLO, its pledge to Israel notwithstanding. Dean was the target of an assassination attempt in 1980. The Front for the Liberation of Lebanon from Foreigners claimed responsibility, but this group was later identified in interviews with Israeli intelligence sources as an Israeli-controlled operation. Dean always maintained that Israel was behind the attempt to kill him, and this evidence, in addition to Israel's assassination of several Palestinians involved in contacts with the United States, appears to bear out Dean's claim. Correspondence with the State Department during 1979, to which Dean provided me access, illustrates the extent of these U.S. PLO contacts in ways that are not fully reflected in the official State Department documentary, Series Foreign Relations of the United States. They include, for example, extensive exchanges on PLO efforts to free American hostages held in the embassy in Tehran, a number of whom were apparently released at least in part because of Palestinian intercession with the Iranian revolutionary regime. While the contacts began via intermediaries, they led to direct meetings between Dean and, among others, Brigadier Saad Sale, Abu al-Walid, a former Jordanian army officer, the PLO's chief of staff, and its senior military officer. He, too, was later assassinated, perhaps by Syrian agents or possibly by those of Israel. As important as the extent and range of the exchanges was their tenor. The Palestinian intermediaries involved talked at length with Dean and one of his colleagues about terms. For the PLO's acceptance of SC-242, it was willing to do this with some reservations, and how that could lead to official, open U.S.-Palestinian contacts. 
agreement on this matter was never reached. The Palestinians involved repeatedly relayed the PLO's desire for recognition from Washington of its efforts, on behalf of U.S. interests, but Dean was authorized only to express his government's gratitude for the provision of security to American institutions. The United States never offered the political recompense for these services that the Palestinian leadership apparently expected. While American contacts were ongoing with the PLO in Beirut, President Jimmy Carter's administration, working to hold a multilateral Middle East peace conference in Geneva, issued a joint communique with the USSR in October 1977. The communique broke ground, referring to participation of all parties to the conflict, including those of the Palestinian people. A statement made by Carter some months earlier, calling for a homeland for the Palestinians, signaled a different tone in Washington. However, under pressure from the newly elected Likud government in Israel, led by Munekim Begin, and from Egypt's Anwar Sadat, the administration soon abandoned its push for a comprehensive settlement, and the inclusion of the Palestinians in negotiations.63 instead, it adopted the bilateral Camp David process, resulting in the separate Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty of 1979. This process was specifically designed by Begin to freeze out the PLO, allow unimpeded colonization of the occupied territories occupied in 1967, and put the Palestine issue on hold, which is where it remained for over a decade. While Sadat and American officials feebly protested this sidetracking of the Palestinian issue, whose importance Carter had stressed at the outset of his presidency, in the end they acquiesced. For Sadat, the treaty restored the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt. For begin, the unilateral Egyptian peace strengthened Israel's control of the rest of the occupied territories and permanently removed Egypt from the Arab-Israeli conflict. For the United States, the treaty completed Egypt's shift from the Soviet to the American camp, defusing the most dangerous aspects of the superpower conflict in the Middle East. Given the vital importance of these national goals to all three parties, Begin was allowed to dictate the terms where Palestine was concerned at Camp David and in the 1979 peace treaty. All of this was apparent to the PLO leadership, and the later phases of their indirect interaction with the United States government reflected their increasing bitterness. They saw that the PLO's cooperation in Lebanon, far from having been reciprocated, was in fact repaid with further isolation of the organization by the United States and its Israeli ally. Although under Carter the United States had come close to endorsing the Palestinians' national rights and their involvement in negotiations, the two sides found themselves farther apart than ever. Camp David and the Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty signaled U.S. alignment, with the most extreme expression of Israel's negation of Palestinian rights an alignment that was consolidated by Ronald Reagan's administration. Begin and his successors in the Likud, Yitzhak Shamir, Ariel Sharon, and then Benjamin Netanyahu, were implacably opposed to Palestinian statehood, sovereignty, or control of the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem. Ideological heirs of Zayev Jabotinsky, they believed that the entirety of Palestine belonged solely to the Jewish people and that a Palestinian people with national rights did not exist. At most, autonomy might be possible for the local Arabs, but this autonomy would apply only to people, not to the land. Their explicit aim was to transform the entirety of Palestine into the land of Israel. Via the treaty with Egypt, Begin ensured that nothing would interfere with the implementation of the Likud vision. The foundation he had cannily laid down, which was adopted by the United States, formed the basis of everything that would follow. Future negotiations would be restricted to the terms of self-rule for an infinitely extendable interim period and exclude any discussion of sovereignty, statehood, Jerusalem, the fate of refugees, and jurisdiction over the land, water, and air of Palestine. Meanwhile, 
Israel set about reinforcing its colonization of the occupied territories. In spite of occasional meek American and Egyptian protestations, the conditions imposed by Begin set the ceiling of what the Palestinians were allowed to negotiate for. In the wake of the 1979 peace treaty, conditions became even worse for the Palestinians. The Lebanon war ground on, destroying much of the country, exhausting its people, and debilitating the PLO. At different stages, the PLO found itself facing the Israeli, Syrian, and Lebanese armies, as well as Lebanese militias supported covertly by an array of states, including Israel, the United States, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. Nevertheless, after all this and despite an Israeli incursion in 1978, the Litani operation, which left a swath of South Lebanon under the control of its proxy, the South Lebanese army, the PLO was still standing. Indeed, it remained the strongest force in large parts of Lebanon. Those that were not in the hands of foreign armies or their proxies, including West Beirut, Tripoli, Sidon, the Shuf Mountains, and much of the South. It would take one more military campaign to dislodge the PLO, and in 1982, American Secretary of State General Alexander Haig agreed to Ariel Sharon's plans for Israel to finish off the organization, and with it Palestinian nationalism. Chapter 4 The Fourth Declaration of War, 1982 the attack or bombardment of towns, villages, habitations or dwellings which are undefended is prohibited. Article 25, Annex to the Hague Convention, July 29, 1899 You are afraid to tell our readers and those who might complain to you that the Israelis are capable of indiscriminately shelling an entire city. New York Times Beirut Bureau Chief Thomas Friedman to his editors by 1982, Beirutis had lived through many years of war. They were used to the sound of explosions and had learned from experience to distinguish among them. On June 4 that year, a Friday, I was in a meeting of the admissions committee at the American University of Beirut, where I had been teaching for the past six years. It seemed like a routine end of the week. Suddenly, we heard the thunderous sound of what must have been multiple 2,000-pound bombs exploding in the distance. We quickly recognized the gravity of what was happening, and the meeting broke up immediately. This aerial bombardment was the opening salvo in Israel's 1982 invasion of Lebanon directed against the PLO. Everyone in the country had long been expecting it, and most had been dreading it. Our two daughters, Lamia, who was five and a half, and Dima, then almost three, were at kindergarten and nursery school in different places. With the screeching roar of supersonic warplanes diving to attack in the background, one of the most terrifying sounds on earth, I rushed to my car to pick the girls up from their schools. Everyone on the road that day drove with the heedless abandon they always displayed when the fighting started up again in Beirut, that is, they drove only slightly more recklessly than usual. My wife, Mona, then in her fourth month of pregnancy, was at work at Wafa, the PLO's Palestine news agency, where she was chief editor of its English language bulletin. As best as I could tell, the colossal explosions rocking the Lebanese capital seemed to be coming from the teeming Fakani district of West Beirut, a couple of miles away. Adjacent to the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps, the Wafa office was located there, as were most of the PLO's information and political offices. The site of the explosions was soon confirmed by radio reports. The Beirut telephone system, never very reliable and even less so after seven years of war, was so overloaded that I could not get through to Mona. I had no way to reach her and no idea of what was happening. I hoped she had taken shelter in the basement of the rundown Wafa building. Luckily, the AUB was close to the girls' schools. Mona and I were always anxious about being able to reach them quickly whenever the on-again, off-again fighting began. During the first few years of the intermittent war in Lebanon, 1982-1983, 
we had never been afraid for ourselves, but there was constant worry once the girls started going to school. Our daughters, and later our son, were born in Beirut in the midst of the war, and by virtue of the fact of having parents who were politically involved, as were almost all of the 300,000 or so Palestinians in Lebanon, they were seen as terrorists by the Israeli government and some others, as were Mona and I. To my distress, those most likely to label us in this way were now preparing to invade the city. Although it could almost have been a normal Beirut Friday school pickup, even with the shuddering explosions in the distances, I knew that our lives would not be normal for quite a while. I soon had the girls safely at home, and my mother and I calmed them as well as we could against the relentless thunderous noise outside. When Mona finally got home, I learned that in spite of the heavy aerial bombardment, she had decided not to heed advice to go down to a basement shelter. From her experience over many years of war, she knew that a prolonged assault, as that one was, would mean she could be stuck there and separated from the girls for many hours. So instead she slipped out of the office and started off for home. With everyone in the street running away from the bombing and no cars or taxis in sight, she ran, too. A breathless mile or so away, near the UNESCO offices, she found a cab willing to stop and take her the rest of the way safely. This experience had no apparent effect on the baby she was carrying, our son Ismail, who was born a few months later, although for a very long time after, he remained extremely sensitive to loud sounds. On that Friday, Israeli warplanes bombed and flattened dozens of buildings, including a sports stadium near the Fakani neighborhood, on the pretext that they housed PLO offices and facilities. The intense bombardment of targets in Beirut and the south of Lebanon that continued into the next day were the prelude to a massive ground assault starting on June 6, which ultimately led to Israel's occupation of much of Lebanon. The offensive culminated in a seven-week siege of Beirut that finally ended with a ceasefire on August 12. During the siege, entire apartment buildings were obliterated and large areas devastated in the western half of the already badly damaged city. Nearly 50,000 people were killed or wounded in Beirut and the rest of Lebanon, while the siege constituted the most serious attack by a regular army on an Arab capital since World War II. It was not to be equaled until the U.S. occupation of Baghdad in 2003. The 1982 invasion of Lebanon was a watershed in the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. It was the first major war since May 15, 1948, to mainly involve the Palestinians rather than the armies of the Arab states. Palestinian Fedayeen had faced Israeli troops in combat from the mid-1960s on, in Karameh in Jordan, in southern Lebanon in the late 1960s and the 1970s, notably in the 1978 Lidani operation, and in a furious exchange of fire across the Lebanese-Israeli border in the summer of 1981. In spite of the repeated attempts to uproot the PLO, however, it had built up such a position of strength in Lebanon both politically and militarily that relatively limited operations of this nature had made only a minimal impact. The invasion in 1982 was of an entirely different order in terms of its aims, scale, and duration, the heavy losses involved, and its long-range impact. Israel's war on Lebanon had multiple objectives, but what distinguished it was its primary focus on the Palestinians and its larger goal of changing the situation inside Palestine. While the general scheme for the war was approved by Prime Minister Munekim Begin and the Israeli cabinet, they were often kept in the dark by the invasion's architect, Defense Minister Ariel Sharon, regarding both his real goals and his operational plans. Although Sharon wanted to expel the PLO and Syrian forces from Lebanon and create a pliable allied government in Beirut, to transform circumstances in that country, his chief objective was Palestine itself. From the perspective of proponents of Greater Israel such as Sharon, Begin, and Yitzhak Shamir, destroying the PLO militarily and eliminating its power in Lebanon, 
would also put an end to the strength of Palestinian nationalism in the occupied West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem. These areas would thereby become far easier for Israel to control and ultimately annex former Israeli chief of staff Mordecai Ger, speaking to a secret session of a Knesset committee at the outset of the war, approvingly summed up its purpose, in the occupied territories, in the final analysis the idea was to limit the PLO leadership's influence in order to provide us with greater freedom of action. In scale, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon involved the equivalent of eight divisions, well over 120,000 troops, a large proportion of them reservists, the country's largest mobilization since the 1973 war. For the first couple of weeks of the war, this massive force engaged in intermittent but fierce battles with a few thousand Palestinian and Lebanese fighters in southern Lebanon, and in ferocious combat with two divisions of Syrian armor and infantry in the Baika Valley and the mountains of the Shuf, and Metan districts east of Beirut. On June 26, Syria accepted a ceasefire, which explicitly excluded the PLO, and sat on the sidelines for the rest of the war. The subsequent siege of Beirut involved air and artillery bombardments of the city and sporadic ground combat solely, with the forces of the PLO and its Lebanese allies. During the ten weeks of fighting from early June through mid-August, 1982, according to Lebanese official statistics, more than 19,000 Palestinians and Lebanese, mostly civilians, were killed, and more than 30,000 wounded. The strategically located Ain al Hilwa Palestinian refugee camp near Sidon, the largest in Lebanon with over 40,000 residents, was almost entirely destroyed after its population offered fierce resistance to the Israeli advance. In September, a similar fate befell the twin Sabra and Shatila camps in the Beirut suburbs, scene of an infamous and grisly massacre after the fighting had supposedly ended. From the mid-1960s on, in Karamei in Jordan, in southern Lebanon in the late 1960s and the 1970s, notably in the 1978 Lidani operation, and in a furious exchange of fire across the Lebanese-Israeli border in the summer of 1981. In spite of the repeated attempts to uproot the PLO, however, it had built up such a position of strength in Lebanon both politically and militarily that relatively limited operations of this nature had made only a minimal impact. The invasion in 1982 was of an entirely different order in terms of its aims, scale, and duration, the heavy losses involved, and its long-range impact. Israel's war on Lebanon had multiple objectives, but what distinguished it was its primary focus on the Palestinians and its larger goal of changing the situation inside Palestine. While the general scheme for the war was approved by Prime Minister Munekim Begin and the Israeli cabinet, they were often kept in the dark by the invasion's architect, Defense Minister Ariel Sharon, regarding both his real goals and his operational plans. Although Sharon wanted to expel the PLO and Syrian forces from Lebanon and create a pliable allied government in Beirut, to transform circumstances in that country, his chief objective was Palestine itself. From the perspective of proponents of Greater Israel such as Sharon, Begin, and Yitzhak Shamir, destroying the PLO militarily and eliminating its power in Lebanon would also put an end to the strength of Palestinian nationalism in the occupied West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem. These areas would thereby become far easier for Israel to control and ultimately annex former Israeli chief of staff Mordecai Ger, speaking to a secret session of a Knesset committee at the outset of the war, approvingly summed up its purpose, in, the occupied territories, in the final analysis the idea was to limit the PLO, leadership's influence in order to provide us with greater freedom of action, 3. In scale, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon involved the equivalent of eight divisions, well over 120,000 troops, a large proportion of them reservists, the country's largest mobilization since the 1973 war. Point four for the first couple of weeks of the war, 
This massive force engaged in intermittent but fierce battles with a few thousand Palestinian and Lebanese fighters in southern Lebanon, and in ferocious combat with two divisions of Syrian armor and infantry in the Baika Valley and the mountains of the Shuf and Metan districts east of Beirut. On June 26, Syria accepted a ceasefire, which explicitly excluded the PLO, and sat on the sidelines for the rest of the war. The subsequent siege of Beirut involved air and artillery bombardments of the city and sporadic ground combat solely, with the forces of the PLO and its Lebanese allies. During the ten weeks of fighting from early June through mid-August, 1982, according to Lebanese official statistics, more than 19,000 Palestinians and Lebanese, mostly civilians, were killed, and more than 30,000 wounded. Point five. The strategically located Ain al Hilwa Palestinian refugee camp near Sidon, the largest in Lebanon with over 40,000 residents, was almost entirely destroyed after its population offered fierce resistance to the Israeli advance. In September a similar fate befell the twin Sabra and Shatila camps in the Beirut suburbs, scene of an infamous and grisly massacre after the fighting had supposedly ended. Beirut and many other areas in the south and the Shuf Mountains sustained severe damage, while Israeli forces periodically cut off water, electricity, food, and fuel to the besieged western part of the Lebanese capital as they intermittently, but at times very intensively bombarded it from air, land, and sea. The official Israeli toll of military casualties during the ten weeks of war and siege totaled more than 2,700, with 364 soldiers killed and nearly 2,400 wounded. The invasion of Lebanon and the subsequent lengthy occupation of the southern part of the country, which ended only in 2000 involved Israel's third-highest military casualty toll among the six major wars in its 70-plus year history. Throughout the ten weeks of bombardment and the siege of West Beirut, my family, Mona, our two daughters, my mother, Selwa, my younger brother Raja, and I, stayed together in our apartment in the built-up Zarif neighborhood of West Beirut. The front lines had come uncomfortably close to my mother's home in the southern suburb of Herat Reich, forcing her and my brother to move in with us. When we were able to visit their apartment after the fighting ended, we found that the kitchen had suffered a direct hit from an Israeli artillery shell. Being together meant that each of us in the family knew where the others were at all times, and we could help keep up our general morale, despite the many privations of the siege caring for two little children cooped up at home, coping with the acute shortages of water, electricity, and fresh food and the stench of burning garbage, which we withstood along with hundreds of thousands of other West Beirutis. We had endured years of civil war, weathering heavy bombardments and even Israeli air attacks, but this siege, with its volume of Israeli artillery fire from land and sea and the relentless aerial bombing, was far more intense and ferocious. During this existential crisis for the Palestinian cause, which felt to many of us as if life and death hung in the balance, I acted as an off-the-record source for Western journalists, with some of whom I had become friends over the years. Free from the obligation to present the PLO's official line, but still in close touch with colleagues at Wafa, where I had once worked, I was able to provide my own frank assessment of events. Meanwhile, Mona continued to edit the Wafa English-language news bulletin, although given her pregnancy it was now far too dangerous for her to go to the old office in the Fakani neighborhood, and she had to work remotely. Point eight. It was fortunate for the presentation of the Palestinian point of view that Beirut had always been the journalistic nerve center of much of the Middle East, as well as the Center for Espionage, with most journalists located in the western part of the city. Among them were veteran war correspondents who had covered the Arab-Israeli and Lebanese conflicts for many years, and were mostly immune to obvious propaganda, whether be it the unsubtle messaging of the PLO, the harsh rhetoric of the Maronite Lebanese Front, the formulaic bluster of the Syrian regime, or the slick. Devious Hasbara that Israel had mastered.
Because of their presence in Beirut, the course of the war was well covered by the international media. The previous July, Israel and the PLO had engaged in an intense two-week exchange of fire across the border, with Israel's aviation and artillery pounding South Lebanon and PLO rocket and artillery units hitting targets across northern Israel. In consequence, large numbers of Lebanese and Palestinian civilians had been forced to flee their homes, while Israelis in Galilee were confined to shelters or fled. This fierce fighting culminated in a July 25, 1981, ceasefire negotiated by U.S. Presidential Envoy Ambassador Philip Habib, which, remarkably, held for the next 10 months with very few violations. However, it was clear that the Begin government and Ariel Sharon were not satisfied with this outcome. Warnings of Israeli war preparations had reached Lebanese and Palestinian leaders, the media, and others. One of these warnings was delivered in a spring 1982 briefing for researchers that I attended at the Institute for Palestine Studies. It was delivered by Dr. Yevgeny Primakov who was director of the Soviet Oriental Institute and reputed to be a senior officer of the KGB. Primakov was blunt, Israel would soon attack Lebanon, the United States would support it fully, and the USSR did not have the capability to prevent the attack or to protect its Lebanese and Palestinian allies. Moscow, he said, would be hard-pressed to prevent the war from extending to Syria or to preserve its main regional ally the Syrian regime. We were told that he had said much the same things to the PLO leadership. So none of U.S. should have been surprised when the war started with the bombing of Beirut on June 4, 1982, although the scope and scale of what followed was much greater than I and others expected. By contrast, Yasser Arafat and other PLO leaders had long understood that when war came, Sharon would push his army all the way to Beirut. They had clearly been preparing for this eventuality, stockpiling ammunition and supplies, moving offices and files, and preparing shelters and backup command centers. Starting on June 6, Israel's immense armored columns, often preceded by amphibious and helicopter landings of commandos, pushed northward rapidly beyond Sidon along the coast toward Beirut. Other Israeli armored units simultaneously advanced through the Shuf Mountains in the center of the country, while still others fought up the Baika Valley to the east. The invading force of eight divisions enjoyed absolute superiority in numbers and equipment on all fronts, as well as complete control of the air and sea. Although difficult terrain or heavily built-up areas combined with determined resistance could briefly hinder such a forceful offensive. Only very heavy Israeli casualties would have potentially slowed if not stopped it. Thus on June 13, Israeli troops arrived at the strategic Kalda intersection on the coast road just south of Beirut, where Palestinian, Lebanese, and Syrian combatants were eventually overwhelmed. Point one Israeli tanks and artillery soon after appeared, near the presidential palace in Baabda and in other suburbs in the eastern part of the capital. West Beirut was now encircled, and the siege was about to begin. Following the Israeli offensive that drove Syrian forces out of the mountain towns overlooking Beirut and into a separate ceasefire, the PLO was alone in the field with its allies in the Lebanese national movement. The siege was tightening, Israeli forces bombarded West Beirut seemingly at will, and there was no prospect of relief or meaningful support from any quarter. In certain cases, the Israeli shelling and bombing were carefully targeted, sometimes on the basis of good intelligence. All too often, however, that was not the case. Scores of 8 to 12-story apartment buildings were destroyed in airstrikes all over the western part of the city, especially in the Fakani Arab University district, hitting many empty PLO offices as well as residential homes. Many of the buildings that were leveled there and elsewhere, along the shore in the Rauch neighborhood, for example, where my cousin Walid's apartment was destroyed by an artillery shell, had no plausible military utility.
Although his editors at the New York Times removed the offending word from his article, reporter Thomas Friedman at one point described the Israeli bombardment as indiscriminate. He was referring specifically to the sporadic shelling of neighborhoods like the area around the Commodore Hotel, where he and most journalists were staying, and which certainly contained nothing whatsoever of military interest. The only possible objective of such blanket bombardment was to terrorize the population of Beirut and turn it against the PLO. In spite of this firestorm, and even with Israel's extensive aerial surveillance capabilities and its many hundreds of agents and spies planted in Lebanon, the war took place before the age of the reconnaissance drone, not one of the PLO's several functioning underground command and control posts or its multiple communications centers was ever hit. Nor was a single PLO leader killed in the attacks, although many civilians died when the Israeli Air Force missed its targets. This is surprising, given just how extensive were Israel's efforts to liquidate them. Israel's leaders were clearly unconcerned about killing civilians trying to do so, after an air attack in July 1981 destroyed a building in Beirut with heavy civilian casualties. Begin's office had stated that Israel was no longer refraining from attacking guerrilla targets in civilian areas. Arafat himself was a prime target. In an August 5 letter to Ronald Reagan, Begin wrote that these days he felt as if he and his valiant army were facing Berlin Ewehr, amongst innocent civilians, Hitler and his henchmen hide in a bunker deep beneath the surface. Begin often drew such parallels between Arafat and Hitler, if Arafat was another Hitler, then killing him was certainly permissible and justified, whatever the cost in civilian lives. One of Israel's most notorious supposed spies, known to Beirutis as Abu Rish, father of the feather, he sometimes wore a feather in his cap, often camped out opposite my mother-in-law's apartment building in the Monura district of West Beirut and sometimes even in her lobby. His eccentric appearance was familiar to passers-by and to my daughters, watching him from the balcony above, who remember him more than 35 years later. Some Beirutis reported seeing him later guiding Israeli troops, although that may have been an urban legend. In an interview with me in Tunis two years after the war, Chief of PLO Intelligence Abu Iyad, Sulah Caliph, helped explain why Israel may have failed to hit some of its intended targets, for all its vaunted intelligence services. During the siege, the PLO had managed to obtain a continuous flow of fuel, food supplies, and munitions by transferring them across lines controlled by a branch of the mainly Maronite Lebanese front, which was allied with Israel. It was a simple matter of money, he said in his rumbling, low smoker's voice, and the systematic use of double agents, the employment of whom might have also had something to do with the high survival rate of PLO leaders. But one should never trust a double agent, he told me. Anyone you can buy can be bought again. In a cruel irony, it was a double agent who had been turned again who assassinated Abu Iyad in Tunis in 1991. Toward the end of the siege, on August 6, I was near a half-finished eight-story apartment building a few blocks from where we lived when a precision-guided munition demolished it. I had stopped to drop off a friend at his parked car not far from the building. I had almost reached home as planes swooped down, and I heard a huge explosion behind me. Later I saw that the entire building was flattened, pancaked into a single mound of smoking rubble. The structure, which had been full of Palestinian refugees from Sabra and Shatila, had reportedly just been visited by Arafat. At least 100 people, probably more, were killed, most of them women and children. Days later, my friend told me that immediately after the air attack, just as he got into his car, shaken but unhurt, a car bomb exploded nearby presumably having been set to kill the rescuers who were helping families trying to find their loved ones in the rubble. Such car bombs, a weapon of choice for the Israeli forces besieging Beirut, and one of their most terrifying instruments of death and destruction, were described by one Mossad officer as, 
killing for killing's sake. This dirty war continued until the PLO was forced to agree to evacuate Beirut, under intense pressure from Israel, the United States, and their Lebanese allies, and in the absence of meaningful support from any Arab government. The exit negotiations took place primarily via Ambassador Habib's exchanges with Lebanese intermediaries, but also involved France and some Arab governments, notably Saudi Arabia and Syria. Until the end, and despite some shifts in the American cast of characters and attitude toward Israel, the United States remained committed to achieving Israel's core war aim, the defeat of the PLO and its expulsion from Beirut. Israel demanded complete and virtually unconditional PLO withdrawal from the city, an aim which the United States fully endorsed, employing Cold War tropes that they knew would resonate in Washington. Begin and Sharon had early on convinced President Reagan and his administration that the PLO was a terrorist group, aligned with the evil Soviet empire and that its elimination would be a service to both the United States and Israel. All U.S. diplomacy during the war flowed from that shared conviction. The PLO thus faced not only fierce military pressure from Israel, but also unremitting diplomatic coercion from Israel's U.S. ally. That coercion was intense and constant, and it was accompanied by Israeli and American campaigns of disinformation and deception about the course of the negotiations, designed to sap Palestinian and Lebanese morale and precipitate a quick surrender. Meanwhile, the United States also provided indispensable material support to its ally, to the tune of $1.4 billion in military aid annually in both 1981 and 1982. This paid for the myriad of U.S. weapons systems and munitions deployed in Lebanon by Israel, from F-16 fighter bombers to M-113 armored personnel carriers, 155 mm and 175 mm artillery, air-to-ground missiles, and cluster munitions. Beyond the intertwined roles of Israel and the United States, one of the shabbiest and most shameful subsidiary aspects of the war was the capitulation of the leading Arab regimes to American pressure. Their governments loudly proclaimed their support for the Palestinian cause, but did nothing to back the PLO as it stood alone, but for its Lebanese allies, against Israel's military onslaught, and as an Arab capital was besieged, bombarded and occupied. They did no more than issue pro forma objections as the United States championed Israeli demands to expel the PLO from Beirut. The Arab League foreign ministers, meeting on July 13 in preparation for the Arab summit later that year, proposed no action in response to the war, which by then had been ongoing for over five weeks. Instead, the Arab states meekly acquiesced. This was notably true of Syria and Saudi Arabia, which had been chosen by the Arab League to represent the Arab position on a mission to Washington during the summer of 1982. Such Arab governmental opposition as there was to the war was cheaply bought off with flimsy American promises to issue a brand new U.S., Middle East diplomatic initiative, eventually unveiled on September 1 and later dubbed the Reagan Plan. The initiative would have placed a limit on Israeli settlements and created an autonomous Palestinian authority in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, but it ruled out a sovereign Palestinian state in these territories. The Reagan Plan, which the United States never forcefully promoted and which was effortlessly torpedoed by the Begin government, ultimately went nowhere. Among Arab public opinion, however, the invasion of Lebanon and siege of Beirut, whose gripping televised images were widely broadcast, provoked great shock and anger. Yet nowhere was there enough popular pressure on any of the repressive and undemocratic Arab governments to force an end to Israel's siege of an Arab capital or secure better terms for the PLO's withdrawal. There were few mass demonstrations and little open unrest in most of the heavily policed Arab cities. Ironically, perhaps the largest demonstration in the Middle East provoked by the war took place in Tel Aviv, in protest against the Sabra and Shatila massacres.
Israelis might have fought the war and suffered casualties. But once again Palestinians found that the foe on the battlefield was backed by a great power from the outset. The decision to invade Lebanon was made by Israel's government, but it could not have been implemented without the explicit assent given by Secretary of State Alexander Haig, or without American diplomatic and military support, combined with the utter passivity of the Arab governments. The green light that Haig gave to Israel, for what was supposedly a limited operation, was as bright as could be. On May 25, Ten days before the offensive began, Sharon met with Haig in Washington and laid out his ambitious war plan in explicit detail. Indeed, Sharon gave Haig a much fuller picture than he later presented to the Israeli cabinet. Haig's only response was that there must be a recognizable provocation, one that would be understood internationally. Soon after, the attempted assassination of Israel's ambassador in London, Shlomo Argov, by the anti-PLO Abu Nadal group, provided just such a provocation. Sharon explained to Haig that Israel's forces would eradicate the PLO presence in Lebanon, including all the terrorist organizations, the military structures, and the political headquarters, which were located in Beirut. This element of the plan alone belied Sharon's description of a limited operation. Israel would also expel Syria from Lebanon, as a byproduct, although Sharon piously insisted that he did not want war with Syria, and install a puppet Lebanese government. The exposition was clear, as was the green light from Haig for a limited operation, noted by the American diplomat who recorded this as the meeting's outcome. While the PLO knew it could expect little support from the Arab regimes in power in 1982, the organization had counted on a sympathetic response from the Lebanese people. However, the PLO's heavy-handed and often arrogant behavior in the preceding decade and a half had seriously eroded popular support for the Palestine cause in general and especially for the Palestinian presence in Lebanon. In a typical incident that occurred near the Institute for Palestine Studies, located in Beirut's Gentile Verdun neighborhood, the guards for a senior PLO leader, Colonel Abu Zaim, who himself was hardly a paragon, shot and killed a young Lebanese couple in their car late one night when they failed to stop at a checkpoint hastily erected near his apartment. Given PLO indiscipline, no one was punished for these deaths. Such inexcusable acts were all too common. Palestinian operations in Lebanon were supposedly constrained within a formal framework, the Cairo Agreement, adopted in 1969, which had given the PLO control of Palestinian refugee camps and freedom of action in much of South Lebanon. But the heavily armed PLO had become an increasingly dominant and domineering force in many parts of the country. Ordinary Lebanese people were aggrieved that this oppressive Palestinian presence had only intensified, as the long civil war dragged on. The creation of what amounted to a PLO mini-state in their country was ultimately unsustainable, as it was intolerable to many Lebanese. There was also deep resentment of the devastating Israeli attacks on Lebanese civilians, that were provoked by Palestinian military actions. The PLO's assaults in Israel were often directed at civilian targets, and visibly did little to advance the Palestinian national cause if indeed they did not harm it. Inevitably, all these factors turned important sectors of the Lebanese population against the PLO. An inability to see the intensity of the hostility prompted by its own misbehavior and flawed strategy, was among the gravest shortcomings of the PLO during this period. So it was that when the moment of truth came in 1982, the PLO suddenly found itself bereft of support from many of its traditional allies, including three key groups. These were the Syrian-aligned Amal movement, headed by Navy Barry, and its large Shiite constituency in South Lebanon and the Baika Valley, although young Amal militiamen nevertheless fought valiantly alongside the PLO in many areas, the strategically located Druze fiefdom of Walid Jumblat in the Shuf Mountains, southeast of Beirut, 
and the Sunni urban populations of Beirut, Tripoli, and Sidon. The backing of Sunni political leaders had been essential to defending the Palestinian political and military presence in Lebanon since the 1960s. It is not hard to understand the reasoning of these leaders and the communities they represented. Southerners, most of them Shirites, had suffered more than any other Lebanese from the PLO's actions. Besides its own violations and transgressions against the population in the South, the PLO's very presence had exposed them to Israeli attacks, forcing many to flee their villages and towns repeatedly. It was understood by all that Israel was intentionally punishing civilians to alienate them from the Palestinians, but there was nevertheless much bitterness against the PLO as a result. Walid Jumblat, whose reasoning was similar, later related that he had no choice but to bow before the overwhelming force of Israel's advance into the Druze region of the Shuf. He may have felt that assurances given by Druze officers in the Israeli army would secure a measure of protection for his community. He came to regret his decision when, starting in late June 1982, the Israeli military and security services supported the penetration of undisciplined and vengeful Maronite militias into Druze-dominated regions like Ali and Bait al-Din, where they committed more of the atrocities for which they were notorious. For the Sunnis, in particular those in West Beirut, the bombardment and siege of the Lebanese capital put an end to their staunch support for the PLO, which they had seen as a vital ally against the domination of the Lebanese state by the Maronites and the armed power of their militias. Some may have been stirred by Palestinian calls to turn Beirut into another Stalingrad or Verdun, but most were aghast at the prospect of the city being devastated by Israeli artillery and airstrikes. Defiance of Israel was all well and good, but not at the cost of the avoidable destruction of their homes and property. This was a crucial shift, without the support of Beirut's largely Sunni population, together with its many Shire residents. Prolonged resistance by the PLO to the Israeli offensive was ultimately futile. These calculations led to a severe erosion of the already weakening support for the PLO, which diminished further during the early days of the fighting, when the South and the Shuf were overrun, Beirut was bombarded and encircled, Syria dropped out of the war, and Philip Habib relayed Israel's harsh demands for the PLO's immediate and unconditional evacuation. A few more weeks into the war, however, the leaders of the three Lebanese Muslim communities changed their position significantly and became more supportive of the PLO. This shift came after the PLO consented to withdraw from Beirut in exchange for ironclad guarantees, for the protection of the civilians who would be left behind. On July 8, the PLO presented its 11-point plan for withdrawal of its forces from Beirut. This plan called for establishing a buffer zone between Israeli forces and West Beirut, coupled with a limited withdrawal of the Israeli army, the lasting deployment of international forces, and international safeguards for the Palestinian, and Lebanese, populations, which would be left behind virtually without defenses once the PLO's fighters had departed. On the strength of this plan, the Lebanese Muslim leaders were convinced that the PLO was sincere in its willingness to depart as a move to save the city. Also, they were deeply disconcerted by mounting evidence of Israel's overt backing for the mainly Maronite LF, since it underlined the vulnerability of their communities in a post-PLO Lebanon dominated by Israel, and its militant allies. These concerns had been reinforced by the arrival of the LF militias in the Shuf in late June, and the widespread massacres, abductions, and murders that they carried out there and in the areas of the South under Israeli control. At this stage, after seven years of civil war, such sectarian slaughter was commonplace, and the PLO's forces had served as a primary defender of the country's Muslims and leftists. The Sunni, Shire, and Druze leaders therefore redoubled their backing for the PLO's demands in its 11-point plan. There is a vital thread of U.S. responsibility that must be followed to understand what happened next.
The consequences were not just the result of decisions by Sharon, Begin, and other Israeli leaders, or of the actions of Lebanese militias who were Israel's allies. They were also the direct responsibility of the Reagan administration, which, under pressure from Israel, stubbornly refused to accept the need for any formal safeguards for civilians, rejected the provision of international guarantees, and blocked the long-term deployment of international forces that might have protected non-combatants. Instead, to secure the PLO's evacuation, Philip Habib, operating via Lebanese intermediaries, provided the Palestinians with solemn, categorical written pledges to shield the civilians in the refugee camps and neighborhoods of West Beirut. Typed on plain paper without letterhead, signatures, or identification, these memos were transmitted to the PLO by Lebanese Prime Minister Shafiq Alwazan and later enshrined in the records of the Lebanese government. The first of these memos, dated August 4, cited U.S. assurances about the safety of the camps. The second, two days later, said, We also reaffirm the assurances of the United States as regards safety and security for the camps in Beirut. An American note of August 18 to the Lebanese foreign minister enshrining these pledges stated that law-abiding Palestinian non-combatants remaining in Beirut, including the families of those who have departed, will be authorized to live in peace and security. The Lebanese and U.S. governments will provide appropriate security guarantees on the basis of assurances received from the government of Israel and from the leaders of certain Lebanese groups with which it has been in contact. These assurances were taken by the PLO to constitute binding commitments, and it was on their basis that it agreed to leave Beirut. On August 12, after epic negotiations, final terms were reached for the PLO's departure. The talks were conducted while Israel carried out a second day of the most intense bombardment and ground attacks of the entire siege. The air and artillery assault on that day alone, over a month after the PLO had agreed in principle to leave Beirut, caused more than 500 casualties. It was so unrelenting that even Ronald Reagan was moved to demand that begin halt the carnage. Reagan's diary relates that he called the Israeli prime minister during the ferocious offensive, adding, I was angry. I told him it had to stop or our entire future relationship was endangered. I used the word Holocaust deliberately and said the symbol of his war was becoming a picture of a seven-month-old baby, with its arms blown off. This sharp phone call impelled Begin's government to halt its reign of fire almost immediately, but Israel refused to budge on the crucial issue of international protection for the Palestinian civilian population, as a quid pro quo for the PLO's evacuation. The departure from Beirut of thousands of the PLO's militants and fighting forces between August 21 and September 1 was accompanied by a broad outpouring of emotion in West Beirut. Weeping, singing, ululating crowds lined the routes as convoys of trucks carried the Palestinian militants to the port. They watched as the PLO was forced to evacuate the Lebanese capital, with its leaders, cadres and fighters going to an unknown destiny. They ended up scattered by land and sea over a half dozen Arab countries. The men and women bound for an uncertain exile, some for the second or third time in their lives, were seen as heroes by many Beirutis for having stood up for ten weeks, with no external support to speak of, to the most powerful army in the Middle East. As their convoys rolled through Beirut, no one was aware that a sudden and unilateral American decision, taken under Israeli pressure, meant that the international forces supervising the evacuation, American, French, and Italian troops, would be withdrawn as soon as the last ship left. Israeli obduracy and U.S. acquiescence had left the civilian population unprotected. In the Zarif neighborhood where we lived, only a few buildings had been severely damaged so we managed to survive the siege of Beirut physically unscathed, although I worried about the lasting effect the war might have on our two young daughters. Once PLO forces were gone and the siege was lifted, 
life slowly began to return to normal. Even though Israeli troops still ringed West Beirut and tension remained very high. This seeming normalcy ended soon enough, and we would learn that those assurances delivered to the PLO were not worth the plain white paper they were written on. On September 14, President elect Bashir Jamal, commander of the LF and leader of the Phalangists, was assassinated in a huge bomb blast that destroyed a Phalangist headquarters. This was the trigger for Israel's forces immediately to enter and occupy the western part of the city, despite promises to the United States that it would not do so, where the PLO had previously been headquartered and where its LNM allies were still located. The following day, as Israeli troops swept into West Beirut quickly overpowering scattered and fitful resistance from fighters of the LNM, my family and I feared for our safety as did other Palestinians with connections to the PLO, that is, nearly all Palestinians in Lebanon. They included not only refugees registered and born in Lebanon, but also people with foreign citizenship, work permits, and legal residents like ourselves. Uppermost in all our minds was the Phalangist massacre in the Tal al-Zatar refugee camp in 1976 where 2,000 Palestinian civilians had been slaughtered. In light of the Israeli-LF alliance, the PLO had specifically cited Tal al-Zatar in its 11-point plan and during the negotiations over its evacuation. Our fears were of course compounded by the murders that had been carried out by the LF forces in areas recently occupied by Israel, and by Israel's depiction of the PLO as terrorists with no distinction made between militants and civilians. The morning after Jamal's assassination, amid the sound of heavy gunfire, we heard, through the open windows of our apartment, the approaching roar of diesel engines and the clanking of tank treads. The din was produced by the Israeli armored columns advancing into West Beirut. We knew that we had to get to safety quickly. I was fortunate to reach Malcolm Kerr, the president of the AUB and a good friend, who immediately let us take refuge in a vacant faculty apartment. Mona, my mother, my brother, and I loaded our girls and a few hastily packed things into two cars and sped to the university just before Israeli troops arrived at its gates. The next day, September 16, I was sitting with Kerr and several of my AUB colleagues on the veranda of his residence when a breathless university guard came to tell him that Israeli officers at the head of a column of armored vehicles were demanding to enter the campus to search for terrorists. Kerr rushed off to the university entrance, where, he later told us, he rejected the officers' demands. There are no terrorists on the AUB campus, he said. If you're looking for terrorists, Look in your own army for those who've destroyed Beirut. Thanks to Malcolm Kerr's courage, we were temporarily safe in a faculty apartment at the AUB, but we soon heard that others were at that moment in mortal peril. On the same night, September 16, Raja and I were perplexed as we watched a surreal scene, Israeli flares floating down in the darkness in complete silence, one after another, over the southern reaches of Beirut for what seemed like an eternity. As we saw the flares descend, we were baffled. Armies normally use flares to illuminate a battlefield, but the ceasefire had been signed a month earlier, all the Palestinian fighters had left weeks ago, and any meager Lebanese resistance to the Israeli troops' arrival in West Beirut had ended the previous day. We could hear no explosions and no shooting. The city was quiet and fearful. The following evening, two shaken American journalists, Loren Jenkins and Jonathan Randall of the Washington Post, among the first Westerners to enter the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps, came to tell us what they had seen. They had been with Ryan Crocker, who was the first American diplomat to file a report on what the three of them witnessed, the hideous evidence of a massacre. Throughout the previous night, we learned, the flares fired by the Israeli army had illuminated the camps for the LF militias, whom it had sent there to mop up, as they slaughtered defenseless civilians. Between September 16 and the morning of September 18, 
The militiamen murdered more than 1,300 Palestinian and Lebanese men, women, and children. The flares that had so puzzled my brother and me are described from a very different perspective in Waltz with Bashir, a film and book co-authored by Ari Fulman. An Israeli soldier during the siege of Beirut, Fulman was stationed on a rooftop at the time of the massacre with a unit that launched the flares. In Waltz with Bashir, Fulman refers to concentric circles of responsibility for the mass murder that was facilitated by this act suggesting that those in the outer circles were also implicated. In his mind, the murderers and the circles around them were one and the same. The statement is as true of the war as a whole as it is of the massacres in Sabra and Shatila. A commission of inquiry set up after the events, chaired by Israeli Supreme Court Justice Yitzhak Kahan, established the direct and indirect responsibility of Begin, Sharon and senior Israeli military commanders for the massacres. Most of those named lost their posts as a result of both the inquiry and the general revulsion in Israel over the massacres. However, documents released by the Israel State Archives in 2012 and the unpublished secret appendices to the Kahan Commission reveal even more damning evidence of these individuals' culpability which was far greater than the original 1983 report lays out. The documents expose long-deliberated decisions by Sharon and others to send the practiced phalangist killers into the Palestinian refugee camps, with the aim of massacring and driving away their populations. They also show how American diplomats were repeatedly browbeaten by their Israeli interlocutors and failed to stop the slaughter that the U.S. government had promised to prevent. According to these documents, after the entire PLO military contingent had left Beirut at the end of August 1982, Begin, Shamir, Sharon, and other Israeli officials falsely asserted that some 2,000 Palestinian fighters and heavy weaponry remained in the city, in violation of the evacuation accords. Shamir made the claim in a meeting with an American diplomat on September 17, even though the United States government knew for certain that this was not the case. Sharon himself told the Israeli cabinet a day earlier that 15,000 armed terrorists had been withdrawn from Beirut. Moreover, Israeli military intelligence undoubtedly knew that this number included every single regular PLO military unit in Beirut. Sadly, American diplomats did not challenge Israeli leaders on their spurious figures. Indeed, the documents show that U.S. officials had difficulty standing up to the Israelis over anything to do with their occupation of West Beirut. When Moshe Arendt, Israel's ambassador in Washington, was obliged to listen to a series of harsh talking points read to him that were drafted by Secretary of State George Shultz who by then had taken over from Haig, accusing Israel of a deception, and demanding the immediate withdrawal of its troops from West Beirut, Arendt responded with scorn. I am not sure you guys know what you are doing, he told Lawrence Eagleburger, the deputy secretary of state, and called the American points a fabrication and completely false. Eagleburger suggested that the State Department might issue a statement calling Israel's occupation of West Beirut, contrary to assurances, at which point Arendt's deputy, the 33-year-old Benjamin Netanyahu, weighed in. I would suggest you delete this, he said. Otherwise you give us no choice but to defend our credibility by setting the record straight. We'll end up in a shooting war with each other. After listening to an aside from Netanyahu in Hebrew, Arendt added, I think that is right. Rarely in history has a junior diplomat of a small country spoken thus to a senior representative of a superpower, and been supported in doing so. On September 17, as the massacres Loren Jenkins and John Randall described to us continued, Philip Habib's assistant, Ambassador Morris Draper, was instructed by Washington to press Shamir and Sharon for a commitment to leave West Beirut. Sharon, characteristically, escalated things. There are thousands of terrorists in Beirut, he told Draper. Is it your interest that they will stay there?
Draper did not demur at this false assertion, but when the exasperated U.S. envoy said to the assembled Israeli officials, we didn't think you should have come in, to West Beirut. You should have stayed out, Sharon bluntly told the ambassador, you did not think, or you did think. When it comes to our security, we have never asked. We will never ask. When it comes to existence and security, it is our own responsibility and we will never give it to anybody to decide for us. After Draper mildly challenged Sharon on another claim involving a terrorists, Israel's defense minister flatly said, so we'll kill them. They will not be left there. You are not going to save them. You are not going to save these groups of the international terrorism, sick. Sharon could not have been more chillingly explicit. Unbeknown to Draper or the U.S. government, at that very moment the LF militias that Sharon's forces had sent into the refugee camps, were carrying out the killing of which he spoke, but of unarmed old people, women, and children, not supposed terrorists. If Sharon's forces did not carry out the actual slaughter, they had nonetheless armed the LF to the tune of $118.5 million, trained them, sent them to do the job, and illuminated and facilitated their bloody task with flares. That Sharon's intention to use the LF in this way was premeditated stands out in scores of pages of the secret appendices, to the Commission's report. Sharon, the Army Chief of Staff, Lt. Gen. Raphael Aton, the Chief of Military Intelligence, Major Gen. Yehoshua Sagwi, the head of the Mossad, Yitzhak Yofi, and Yofi's deputy and successor, Nahum Admoni, all knew full well of the atrocities perpetrated by the LF earlier in the Lebanese War. They also knew of the lethal intentions of Bashir Jamal and his followers toward the Palestinians. While those named vigorously denied such knowledge to the Kahan Commission, the evidence that it collected and kept secret is damning, and it informed the Commission's decisions. Nonetheless, the killings in Sabra and Shatila were not just the result of the LF militia's thirst for revenge, or even of these Israeli commanders' premeditation. As with the war itself, these deaths were also the direct responsibility of the U.S. government. In planning for the invasion of Lebanon, Israel's leaders had been wary of repeating the fiasco of 1956, when their country had attacked Egypt without U.S. approval and been forced to back down. Having learned from this bitter experience, Israel only went to war in 1967 after receiving the backing of its American ally. Now, in 1982, launching this war of choice, as many Israeli commentators called it, was entirely dependent on the green light given by Alexander Haig, a point confirmed by well-informed Israeli journalists soon after the war. The new and fuller details revealed in previously unavailable documents make the case clearly. Sharon told Haig exactly what he was about to do in great detail, and Haig gave his endorsement, amounting to another U.S. declaration of war on the Palestinians. Even after a public outcry over the deaths of so many Lebanese and Palestinian civilians, after the televised images of the bombardment of Beirut, after the Sabra and Shatila massacres, American support continued undiminished. In terms of what Ari Fulman called the outer circles of responsibility, American culpability for Israel's invasion extends even further than Haig's green light. The United States supplied the lethal weapons systems that killed thousands of civilians, and that were manifestly not used in keeping with the exclusively defensive purposes mandated by American law. Sharon explicitly forewarned U.S. officials that this would happen. According to Draper's later recollections, after he and Habib met with Sharon in December 1981, he reported to Washington that in Israel's planned attack, we were going to see American-made munitions being dropped from American-made aircraft over Lebanon, and civilians were going to be killed. Moreover, the Israeli High Command and Intelligence Services were not the only ones who were aware of the murderous propensities of the LF toward Palestinian civilians.
their American counterparts were just as knowledgeable about the LF's bloody track record. Because of this knowledge, because of American backing for Israel and tolerance of its actions, its supplies of arms and munitions for use against civilians, its coercion of the PLO to leave Beirut and refusal to deal directly with it, and its worthless assurances of protection. The 1982 invasion must be seen as a joint Israeli-U.S. military endeavor, their first war aimed specifically against the Palestinians. The United States thereby stepped into a position similar to that played by Britain in the 1930s, helping to repress the Palestinians by force in the service of Zionist ends. However, the British were the leading party in the 1930s, while in 1982 it was Israel that called the tune, deployed its might, and did the killing, while the United States played an indispensable but supporting role. After we learned of the massacres in Sabra and Shatila, we knew that it was not safe for us to remain in Beirut, especially with our two small children and with Mona about to have a third. Our journalist friends put us in touch with Ryan Crocker, the senior American political officer and the only U.S. diplomat still at the embassy in West Beirut. Crocker not only offered to arrange our evacuation as U.S. citizens, he would also escort us out of Israeli-occupied Beirut in an armored vehicle belonging to the embassy. But he could take us only to the Israeli-Syrian lines between Bamdown and so far in the Lebanese mountains because of reports of the presence of Iranian Revolutionary Guards in Syrian-controlled territory. When I told him that we had to get farther than that, to nearby Shtora in the Baika Valley, whence we could take a taxi to Damascus, he assented. Crocker was as good as his word. On September 21, the day Amin Jamal was elected President of Lebanon in place of his assassinated brother, we left Beirut with him and a driver, crossed the Israeli and LF lines, reached Shtora, and went on to Damascus by taxi. Once there, however, instead of taking us to our hotel, the driver deposited us at one of the many offices of the Syrian intelligence services. There Mona, now seven months pregnant, my brother, and I were treated to several hours of detention punctuated by separate interrogations of each of us that featured such penetrating questions as, did you see any Israeli soldiers in Beirut? The Syrian security apparatus fortunately did not interrogate my 67-year-old mother or our two little daughters, and eventually we were released, after which we went to our hotel, and then left Damascus as quickly as we could. We flew to Tunis, where we reunited with some of our Palestinian friends from Beirut who had been evacuated there. In Tunis, I first developed the ideas that eventually became my book about the decisions taken by the PLO, during the 1982 war, under siege, and began discussions with some of the PLO leaders whom I later interviewed for the book. We then went on to Cairo, where Mona and I both had family and we realized how badly the war had affected the girls. They went into a wild panic when they heard the screeching rumble of trolley cars in an adjacent street, thinking they were Israeli tanks. As soon as the Israeli army withdrew from West Beirut and the airport opened, we went back to the city. Mona insisted on having our third child delivered by the same obstetrician who had delivered our two daughters, and whose father had delivered Mona herself over thirty years earlier. Our son Ismail was born in November 1982, and I returned to teaching at the AUB and continued to work at the IPS. After a tense few months marked by the suicide bombing of the U.S. Embassy in the spring of 1983, we left Beirut for what we expected would be just a year away. But the Lebanese civil war erupted in force once again, and we never returned to our Beirut home. The political impact of the 1982 war was enormous. It brought about major regional changes that affect the Middle East to this day. Among its most significant lasting results were the rise of Hezbollah in Lebanon and the intensification and prolongation of the Lebanese Civil War, which became an even more complex regional conflict. The 1982 invasion was the occasion of many firsts, 
the first direct American military intervention in the Middle East since U.S. troops had briefly been sent into Lebanon, in 1958, and Israel's first and only attempt at forcible regime change in the Arab world. These events in turn engendered an even fiercer antipathy toward Israel and the United States among many Lebanese, Palestinians, and other Arabs, further exacerbating the Arab-Israeli conflict. These were all consequences that flowed directly from the choices made by Israeli and U.S. policymakers in launching the 1982 war. The war also provoked intense reactions, including widespread revulsion against its results among important segments of Israeli society, leading to the rapid growth of the Peace Now movement, which had been founded in 1978. It also produced the first significant and sustained negative American and European perceptions of Israel since 1948. For many weeks, the international media widely disseminated disturbing images of intense civilian suffering in besieged and bombarded Beirut, the first and only Arab capital to be attacked and then occupied by Israel in this way. No amount of sophisticated propaganda by Israel and its supporters sufficed to erase these indelible images, and as a result, Israel's standing in the world was severely tarnished. The entirely positive image that Israel had assiduously cultivated in the West had been appreciably harmed, at least temporarily. The Palestinians garnered considerable international sympathy as a result of the siege. In another first, they at least partially shed the terrorist label Israeli propaganda had successfully affixed to them, and appeared to many as David facing Israel's Goliath-like military juggernaut. But in spite of this limited improvement in their international image, they failed to obtain sufficient support, whether from the Arab states, the USSR, or others, to counterbalance the grimly determined backing of the Reagan administration for Israel's key war aim of dislodging the PLO from Lebanon. With the PLO's evacuation from Beirut, the Palestinian cause appeared to have been gravely weakened, and Sharon seemed to have achieved all of his core objectives. However, the paradoxical result of these events was gradually to shift the center of gravity of the Palestinian national movement away from the neighboring Arab countries where it had been relaunched in the 1950s and 1960s, moving it back inside Palestine. It was there that the first intifada broke out five years later, in December 1987, with results that shook both Israeli and world public opinion. As the Nakba had done decades earlier, this stinging defeat produced a new and different form of resistance by the Palestinians to the multi-pronged war, being waged against them. Sharon and Begin had launched the invasion to defeat the PLO and demoralize the Palestinians, thereby freeing Israel to absorb the occupied territories, but the end result was to spur their resistance and relocate it inside Palestine. As for those who played a key part in the events of the summer of 1982, for many of them misgivings and regret seemed to dominate their recollections. In interviews with me in 1983 and 1984, Morris Draper and Robert Dillon, the U.S. ambassador to Lebanon at the time, expressed deep remorse for their role in the negotiations with the PLO. Both felt bitterly deceived by Sharon and Begin, who they said had given the United States explicit commitments that Israeli forces would not enter West Beirut. Philip Habib pulled no punches, saying that his government had been deceived not only by Israel, but also by its own Secretary of State, Haig was lying. Sharon was lying, he said to me. The recently released Israeli documents confirmed that a great deal of deception, and perhaps even more self-deception, were going on in Beirut, Washington, and Jerusalem in the spring and summer of 1982. Senior French diplomats I interviewed who were involved in the negotiations over the PLO's evacuation from Lebanon expressed regrets about their failure to get a better deal. They were bitter about their inability to obtain international security guarantees for the Palestinian civilian population and for the long-term stationing of multinational forces to protect the Palestinian civilian population.
They regretted the United States' unilateral handling of the negotiations and its efforts to restrict the involvement of international representatives. At the time, they had warned repeatedly and presciently that the course being followed by the United States would lead to a tragic outcome, but in the end the French government did nothing to prevent it. Within the PLO, its leaders were angry at their betrayal by the United States, which had failed to protect the camps. They expressed sorrow and even a sense of guilt at not having secured ironclad guarantees for the safety of those they left behind. Abu Iyad, who had argued throughout the siege for a tougher negotiating position, explicitly charged the PLO leadership with failing its own people, a judgment that was shared by many Palestinians. A few others held similar opinions. Beyond expressing deep regret at the outcome, Abu Jihad, Khalil Alwazer, was otherwise taciturn and unrevealing. Unsurprisingly, Arafat was the least self-critical. For the United States, its insistence on monopolizing Middle East diplomacy and its furtherance of Israel's ambitions did not serve American interests well. This was glaringly attested to by subsequent events, which included the suicide bombings of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, the U.S. Marines barracks, and of the French troops, who had returned to an ill-defined mission in the city soon after the Sabra and Shatila massacres. Within months, the battleship USS New Jersey was firing shells the size of Volkswagen Beetles into the Shuf Mountains where Druze militias, supported by Syria, were battling the LF, supported by Israel, and the United States became embroiled in a shooting war that few Americans, including many of those directly involved, fully understood. Hezbollah, which grew out of the Lebanese maelstrom, became a deadly foe of the United States and Israel. In considering its rise, few have noted that many of the young men who founded the movement and carried out its lethal attacks on American and Israeli targets, had fought alongside the PLO in 1982. They had remained after the PLO fighters left, only to see hundreds of their fellow Shirites massacred alongside the Palestinians in Sabra and Shatila. The people killed in the U.S. Embassy bombing, the Marines who died in their barracks, and the many other Americans kidnapped or assassinated in Beirut, among them Malcolm Kerr and several of my colleagues and friends at the AUB, largely victims of attacks by the groups that became Hezbollah, paid the price for the perceived collusion between their country and the Israeli occupier. Within Fulman's circles of responsibility, the Lebanese who were directly and indirectly responsible for the massacres paid perhaps the highest price. Bashir Jamal and his lieutenant Eli Hobika were both assassinated, as were several others, and the senior LF leader, and eventually president of the political party it became, Samir Gigi spent 11 years in prison for crimes committed during the Lebanese war, although not for any related to the 1982 invasion. Of the PLO leaders who made the fateful decisions that led to the tragedy in Sabra and Shatila, Abu Jihad and Abu Iyad were both assassinated, the former by Israel and the latter probably by an Iraqi agent. Arafat died after being besieged by Israeli troops in his headquarters in Ramallah. None of them was ever held responsible for the outcomes of the 1982 war. Most of the Israeli decision-makers involved including Begin, Sharon, and several senior generals, endured humiliation or loss of office as a result of the Kahan Commission report and the condemnation within Israel, following the massacres. However, none of them suffered criminal penalties or any other serious sanction. Indeed, the head of Israel's Northern Command, Major General Amir Drori, who was in charge of the invasion forces, served out his term in command and then went off for a year's study leave in Washington, D.C. Both Shamir and Sharon, as well as Netanyahu, went on to serve as prime ministers of Israel. By contrast, none of the American officials involved were ever held responsible for any of their acts, whether their collusion with Israel in launching and waging the 1982 war, 
or the failure of the United States to honor its pledges regarding the security of Palestinian civilians. Many of them, including Reagan, Haig, and Habib, are now dead. All have so far escaped judgment.